restricted. Yeah, so oh, that's still a lot of patients that visit my, my clinic. I need to see the patient and do the surgery every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It is good. Uh, we are here at the iBank Foundation. Uh, we are scheduling uh, people. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, let me just uh, turn the sound off. Uh, we are live from YouTube as well, but I'm uh, turning the uh, sound from YouTube off. So, uh, but uh, I don't think people are going to uh, need to use YouTube. It's just there for uh, the organization things. But uh, we are getting ready, and in uh, 10 minutes, we're going to start. And uh, it's really an honor, Dr. Shima, to have you here. And uh, I want to welcome also Dr. Vasco Bravo. How are good morning, you? Ocho. Good, good. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure being here with you. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to be here. Yeah. And uh, we are waiting for people to connect. So, Harrison, can you see my voice well? You see what? Can I see my voice well? Yeah, yeah it's really good, yeah. Okay. I because I, 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 not use, I did not use a microphone. I'm so very scared about, concerned about that my voice and sounds about it. Is okay? Yeah, it's perfect. It's yeah. great. Okay, perfect. I like using the uh, microphone because uh, it, it's actually it condensates the voice. <laughs> it makes the sound a little clearer. But uh, these computers from today, especially these uh, Mac things, they are very well made. So uh, it, it runs well with uh, their built-in uh, microphones. Mm -hmm. So Raphael, is everything OK? The connection here is, uh, is good. And uh, Rafael is uh, our moderator. Uh, he's been with us uh, in all Red Nelson meetings. This is the, uh, the uh, third one. And also Dr. Edwards, I mean Edwards uh, from the iBank Foundation. Uh, uh, he's probably around. Edwards, are you in? Você tá aí? Ed Edwards. He's coming. He's uh, the moderator oh. from uh, Brazilian language, the Portuguese, I mean. And uh, Dr. Rodrigo Pegado is there too. How are you doing? Hello, he hello everyone. <laughs> How is hello, Rio de Hello, my friend. <laughs> I, I I like your microphone. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's very uh, well. Makes the uh, everything clearer. And uh, yeah, it's better. It's much better. Yeah. Our hours. And uh, Raphael, Hi. did you are, are you getting uh, the speakers uh, as co-hosts? Yeah, uh, I I cannot do that. You have to do it yourself because you are the host. Ah, okay, okay. So I guess uh, almost everybody here is. Uh, into co-host Dr. Robert Devaney is there coming. Good morning, Dr. Devaney. Dr. Devaney uh, was my professor in the University of Toronto together with uh, Dr. Wai Chin Lam uh, into my retinal fellowship. Nice to and, see you. Uh, Hi, Dr. Devian. It's such a pleasure to see you again. Likewise. Thanks for organizing this. This is great. Yeah, I was trying to reduce a little bit of your video, but it is so amazing that I could not reduce it much because it's so good, you know? <laughs> Every detail is important there. And uh, so it was, it was pretty good. And uh, we are having here Dr. Devian, also Rafael, Rafael. Arantes is the co-host and also moderator. And anything you guys did uh, 
uh, in terms of technical things or problems, you just uh, uh, announce and uh, talk to him or talk even here. And uh, we are live on YouTube as well. And uh, we are going to take care of it. That's great. So, Rafael, please tell me if uh, the speakers are in uh, so that I have to put them uh, into uh, co-hosts like uh, Dr. Natarajan just uh, entered. Hi, Dr. Natarajan, how are you doing? It's even I, already in, in I, India. Nice to see you, you see again. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I see you. Yeah, long time. <laughs> yeah, long time no see. How's it going? Yeah, I think uh, you and me are the one maximum traveling now in the Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> it looks very good. Well, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. The last time I saw you guys was in the uh, World uh, Retina Congress uh, in uh, Fort Lauderdale. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, some quite some time. <laughs> Uh, I think that Dr. Sethi is on. I'm not sure if it is Dr. Vibhav Sethi. Vibhav Sethi, yeah, from India. Vibhav Sethi. Aaron Sethi? I don't know. If no, this oh, is... yeah, yeah. Vibhav Sethi is on. Oh, okay. So I'll yeah. make him co host as well. Uh, welcome, Vibhav Sethi. Thank you so much. Hi, Weber. Hello. Uh, uh, yeah. Hello. I guess Dr. Uh, who, who is that? Uh, Dr. Martinez? Is she, she's in? No, not yet. Dr. Martinez uh, asked, uh, asked me to be the uh, uh, first speaker. And uh, after Dr. Martinez, we're going to go on. And uh, uh, how, how about Dr. Uh, Oshima? Do you want to yeah. be the? Uh, do you want to give your uh, keynote lectures lectures after Dr. Martinez? Dr. Yeah. Hiro and Andrea Jucar on. Andrea Jucar is already a co-host. Okay, good morning, André Jouka. Ça va bien avec toi? Good morning, everybody. Très bien, merci, mon ami. <laughs> Dr. Jouka, he trained in France, so he speaks uh, good uh, French. That's great. Real French, not Canadian French. Yeah. In Canada, you know, we spoke, we used to speak some uh, French, uh, but not so much, usually English. Dr. Yonekawa is just uh, coming in. Hi, good morning, everybody. How is everything? Very good. Thank you. Yeah. How is the weather likewise in your area? Oh, weather, um, uh, pretty good. Uh, we've been enjoying, there are a lot of fireflies in our uh, area. And so the kids spend all night catching fireflies. So that's been our new thing these days. Yeah, that's great. Nice having you here, and uh, it's always Thank a you. pleasure. It's an honor. And uh, I am a number one fan of uh, Wills Eye Institute, and many professors of mine from Brazil, they trained in the Wills Eye oh, uh, wow. during my uh, resi residency time. You know? oh, that's great. It's a very good service, and uh, I think you have uh, many branches, no? Many branches, many uh, offices throughout the three states, New Jersey, Delaware, and uh, of course, Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. okay. Dr. Rafael, am I uh, missing anybody for the, uh, the, the, the uh, co-host yeah. here? Gustavo Berlin just entered. Gustavo. Morning, everyone. Sorry for the delay. How are you? Hi, Good. Gustavo. How are you doing? Fine. Komba mani home. Komba uh, mani. <laughs> How's it going? Hi, <laughs> uh, long time no see. How are you? Excellent. Genki desu ka? Genki desu yo. We are going to have uh, Gustavo uh, uh, speak for Dr. Lukan Mishev and uh, his father, 
has uh, died uh, two days ago, and uh, it was unfortunate that uh, he cannot participate because uh, uh, his, his father just uh, passed away. Uh, is he okay now, Gustavo? He's better? Uh, yes, I talked to him this morning early, so he gave me the instructions to present his case. Actually, it's a nice case, and he's okay. His father had a, had a melanoma, and they were waiting, waiting for that. But, you know, beloved people, you always want to be for always, forever with us. That's life. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, uh, I was telling it's Dr. Lam uh, in the previous email mm -hmm. some time ago, uh, the, uh, I think Dr. Lam probably thought the uh, meeting could be 10 p.m., but 10 p.m. in, in Japan. But uh, in uh, Hong Kong, it's uh, 8 p.m. So we are about to start. I will just uh, try giving the WhatsApp call for Dr. Wen Ching Lam to see whether he's, uh, he's going to be uh, ready for the meeting. Because he might think it's a, a little late, but uh, uh, in Hong Kong, that's going to be 8 p.m. right now. So let me see if I, I, I catch him, but uh, he doesn't show up uh, right now. He's going to catch up, catch with us uh, in a few minutes time, I guess. So Dr. Devaney, are you doing uh, many Argus, Argus cases in, uh, in, in Toronto? Well, we did a lot. We did it, I think, more than anywhere in in North America, I, I did 18, but now the company's basically finished. You know, they've had all kinds of financial problems and yeah. they've essentially gone bankrupt from what I can tell, as have virtually every company that's making artificial implants these days. I think perhaps with the exception of Pixium, but I'm not quite sure where they are. I don't know if anyone on the panel knows, but it really is a classic situation of an orphan disease and the economics of it made it very difficult for these companies. Yeah, yeah I understand. And uh, I was listening to Fernando Arevalo talk some years ago here in Brazil, and he was telling that uh, uh, the Ergus 2 would be a lot better with uh, the implant itself, would, have, would need more uh, more wire things or more or, or these mouse screws things, but I don't know whether that uh, went on or not. Maybe not because, uh, especially now, these uh, COVID times, things are a little difficult, I guess. So people are getting in and uh, uh, Rafael, can you see any more uh, speakers so that I can make the uh, co-host? No, no, not for now. Not for now, and uh, I don't see yet uh, uh, Dr. Maria Martinez Castellanos. So I think we should start the meeting in the right time, and then uh, I will I will have uh, Dr. If she doesn't show up in time have Dr. Oshima start his, uh, his talk as well. So uh, may I share my screen now, Dr. Rafael? Yeah. Okay. So let me get it. Should I share uh, down below computer sound, optimize screen or not? Just leave it like that. The, the internet yeah. is, is good, it's okay. Leave it like that, leave it like that. Okay. Looks okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah. So I will start this uh, video over here. Thank you. 
possible, especially my professors who are watching them, you know, to be ready for my rental fellowship in Toronto, Canada. Yeah, it's a great pleasure, and uh, we have here Dr. Yuzuki Oshima. And I said it's a really, really an honor to have you here. And uh, I would like you, Dr. Oshima, uh, to know if you could uh, say some words for our participants. Since, since uh, after your words in this opening event. The, I will start playing your, your great videos. I, I, I became amazed with your videos. They are really, really great. Welcome again. Hi. Uh, here right now, we are right now in Japan. It's 9 p.m. Uh, good evening, everybody. So it's my great honor, uh, honor and the pleasure to be invited to participate in a great meeting. So right in Japan, as you know, we also have the COVID-19 uh, problem. Uh, Hatsun, can, can you hear me? Sure. Let me okay. just, uh... Yeah, but you know, uh, we are very lucky. We don't have so many severe cases uh, with uh, uh, infected with uh, COVID-19. So uh, just a couple of days ago, we just, uh, the government just released uh, quarantine, a very severe quarantine, so we can do much more uh, go back to the more normal, almost on nearly the normal daily life. So that means in so many patients still visit my clinic. They also do a lot of surgery as they previously, you know. So uh, let's ask to start it, our video, okay? okay? Okay. Today I will show you two cases. The so one is a young boy. You uh, young. Your, your cases here? Yeah, can you run this video? Yes, I have the video right here. Yeah, uh, one case is a uh, young coach patient. Another one is uh, very standardized, uh, you know, the well-known uh, drop the crusting lens, how to uh, manage the uh, interest cross suture, uh, interest cross uh, fixation, I'll show here. Yeah, just, just share the screen now.
Yeah, I think it's going to start. All right. Can I just uh, can I run the video? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, just starting now. So. Yeah. Uh, which one you you will show? Yeah, we are going to show first the uh, this one. Oh, this is a cold case. You know, this is a, a junior high school student. It's a it's baseball player. Uh, he had a long-standing codes and getting worse and worse, even though a lot of several times sessions the laser applied another doctor and they consult me to for the surgery. You can see here the patient has still attachment with a somewhat uh, contraction from the uh, the membrane right here. So I do the lens peering, uh, betract me. Uh, to remove the, the membrane, release interaction, and then perform the island peeling. It is done uh, stained with uh, BBG, and you can use the uh, forceps to remove the island. And the most of uh, a severe problem the per at the peripheral area, you know, is a very big, very large angioma localized uh, just at here and strongly at here in the peripheral area. So not only use the forceps, I need to use the scissors to separate the membrane and gentry. But uh, unfortunately, I still, you know, I cannot avoid to make to make the strip uh, region breach in this case. You know, in young patients, it's very, very important to uh, how to release the, the peripheral traction and uh, remove the vitreous as much as you can. But even though in the case you can did it, it did it, but still you can, we will encounter some contraction. So uh, in this case, I performed uh, not only the vitrectomy, I also uh, performed the, uh, the encircling bond to release the perfect contraction. Can you run the video again? Yeah, just a minute. And it is, because this is the case, the basically it's a uh, detachment due to the C last uh, station. So uh, the key point is not make the breaks during the surgery, uh, especially at the posterior pole. So I just uh, do the membrane uh, peeling with uh, uh, vitreous remover. I don't like to make any intentional hole to aspirate uh, the sub the fluid because it can be once you can release all the traction and uh, stabilize the activity of the, uh, of the macro aneurysm, you can make the spontaneous absor absorption of the sub the fluid gently after surgery. The only one concern about this young patient is you know, it's uh, peripheral contraction. So that I, I like to do the not only the uh, between the lung in such a case, uh, if there is some proliferation on the peripheral area, I prefer to do the uh, bacro bacro combined with uh, vitreous, uh, vitrectomy. Just a minute, let me get your video again, just uh, right. escape it from uh, the program here, just a second. And I can tell you the patient the visit, uh, initially visited our clinic, the visual acuity is 2400, uh, very severe. And right now, just uh, six months after the surgery, right now, the almost, uh, most of the sulfuric already, already disappeared and the visual acuity recovered to 20, uh, 2080. It's the most, uh, most of the uh, activity already stabilized. So this, uh, this patient can go back to school and uh, play the baseball uh as a baseball player and do very well dr rafio can you help me here to see this video just a second yeah. just share your screen because you're not sharing it yeah yeah uh, the, the screen just uh just a moment let me go back oh. there sorry for that oshima so otherwise can i uh, run the video here yeah, I think I have here. Yeah, just got it. it. It was hidden. Yeah, it's perfect. Just a second. Let me share it again. Okay, that's it. Sorry about that. Okay, you could go on. 
Oh, let me see. I cannot catch up you. Or oh, here it is. Yeah, this is. Yeah, you know, show the very uh, large membrane uh, covered the uh, angiomer. So once I use the forceps, the peeling off the membrane, and then need to use the scissors to separate the the thick membrane adherent to the angiomer. It's not easy to remove all of the angiomer. Otherwise, we encounter the very severe bleeding during the surgery. So I just release interaction as much as possible I can do, use the cutter, scissors, and uh, the forceps. But I still think that at the periphery, I make, I unfortunately, I made a very small, tiny breach. So I decided to perform the buckle to support this area. Otherwise, even though it's a very tiny breach, because the contraction, because of the contraction may encounter the lead detachment after the surgery. So I also do the laser and uh, combine with the cryo because they were jammed to the angioma. Here is some a large of the uh, bricks are here. So I do use the uh, uh, silicone sponge, uh, make the buckle, the, a little bit wider buckle to support the peripheral area. And then also use the pinpoint laser to apply to the microanalysm and the microanalysm. And even in this case, most doctors prefer to use the silicone oil maybe, but basically I love to use the gas because I like to prevent the subsidic oil the proliferation. So most of my case, my case if the, uh, even if it's, it's a proliferative cases, I prefer to use the, oh, this is the second case, you know. I just still talk about the first case. I prefer to use the gas for tamponade. So this is the second case, it dropped uh, crystal lens. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is not a very hard lens. I can use the high speed cutter. This is a 25 gauge and uh, 10K uh, variable cutter. Uh, the one key point is I, I use uh, uh, forceps to, to insert into the crystal lens. So I can uh, hold it in, into the cavity, use the cutter to remove the uh, lens particles just like the barbecue, we so-called the barbecue technique too. Uh, and then here I show you, this is the Yamane technique to uh, make the intrascrop fixation of the lens. The key point is the forceps, this is also the max grip. I hold the haptics and insert the, it's a very thin inner wall, the 30 gauge needle and guide it the haptics into it and just leave it as it in the vitreal cavity. Don't move, remove it to the outside uh, too early. Just keep it in the eye and then hold another haptics and insert it into another needle and keep both inside the, in, inside the vitreal cavity. And the key point is rotate it gently at the same time and then you can guide it the haptics outside of the eye because if you want, once you remove the one haptic first, it's not easy to insert the second one. So just like here, you loaded both, uh, both haptics together and then control the both, the insert into the eye to control the, the centering, just like you here. And the advantage of this technique, you don't need to uh, make any large uh, peritomy. You can fix the lens that makes a very good centering and adjust the, the depths and control the uh, IOL uh, uh, reflective error. You can control that one uh, at the same time. In great cases, really, really great cases. And uh, especially the two cases are great. And uh, I wanna have Dr. Please, Dr. Diveni and Dr. Vaihapseti to comment on your cases. Uh, please, Dr. Diveni, what did you think about? Some, here are some uh, questions about it. Do you prefer to do the vitrectomy primary? Um, yeah, in this case, of course, uh, you can do the suture first and then um, perform vitrectomy. But you know, if once you do the buckle first, it's not easy to perform the scroll indentation during vitrectomy. So in my case, most of my case, I remove the vitreous and the shaping periphery, and then at the end of the, at the end of the uh, vitrectomy, I uh, suture the buckle. Of, of course, you can do the mattress suture first, and then go to the vitrectomy, and then 
uh, fix the debacle at the end that betrayed me. If you do the debacle first, it's not easy to perform the indentation. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful cases, Dr. Shima. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, now we have a question from Andre Juca. He's asking you which lens you're using for the Yaman fixation. Yeah. Uh, this lens is a Japan, uh, Japanese made Santan IOL, but you can also use uh, some other uh, lens just like Arcon or Amos or release the three piece IOL. And the one P point is uh, checked uh, connecting point uh, connection, uh, connection between the haptics and the optics because you know, one insert is you need to remove it very still, still, still a little bit tangent and stress to the, the connecting point, the haptics and optics. So if it's a weak one, one not, it will be encountering to uh, drop the, the haptic during the surgery. So most of the kids can do it. Just, and we prefer to use a large optics lens because they can, you can make much, you can you choose much longer total lengths of the, uh, of the IOL. So basically my lens, the, the the uh, diameter is about the seven uh, millimeter, and total length maybe around the thirteen or thirteen point five millimeter. Okay, uh, so Doctor Robert Deveni, do you have any comments regarding the surgeries? Um, I, I think the Coates case was great. Um, what I've also done, I find sometimes, as you said, these the subretinal fluid can take a long time. To, to dissipate only because they're often chronic, it's very viscous. I found that they often even have these crystalline proteinaceous subretinal deposits. And, yeah. and it is essential to avoid uh, retinal tears, obviously. Um, and what I've done on a few occasions with good success, I, I try and avoid buckles. I hate doing buckles ever. I, I, I can't remember when I've last done one except on an Argus. Um, but what I've done is I've um, done a vitrectomy and then inject intravitreal perfluorocarbon and then do a scleral cut down as if I'm doing a buckle. So not to create a retinotomy to drain the subretinal fluid, but to drain it posteriorly. And it's interesting, this very thick fluid starts to come out. Oftentimes the fluid will stop as, as a, a little crystalline sure. deposit right. clogs the break. And I literally with a 0.124 set, have to yeah. pick out those pieces yeah. and then the fluid starts to come out again. But it's very gratifying and a quick way to resolve the subretinal fluid. Yeah. I don't know if you tried. Yeah, so if it's a much more prominent case, I try to perform the external drainage from the scroll site. Yeah. It's much safer. So otherwise, you know, just like I told you, we, we don't need to attach to any possible possible area. It's encounters the opening of the whole uh, breaks. You can count the PBR very easy, the younger proliferate case. So in the various case, I, like, I, also, I, I agree with your talk, do you use a powerful carbon so you can display some red fluid to a peripheral area. And some, you know, some that uh, crossing the debris will stack the breaks as you told you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Dr. Vahab Sethi, do you have any comments on this one? Excellent cases, uh, Dr. Oshima. Thank you so much. Uh, I just had a, a quick uh, a question for you. Uh, how do you tackle the angioma? You showed us you do cryotherapy as well as laser. So uh, what is your end point to treat an angioma with cryo or laser? And do you treat the vessels yeah, as well? You know, yeah, basically, you know, if uh, the, the most effective uh, tool may be the intraocular cryo. But we don't have it. If the very giant angioma, it's not easy to stop the, the activity. So you only use the laser. You know, even your laser cooperation, you can only collaborate the outside. You cannot do the inside. So the reason why I use a cryo, the reason why I combine with the screctomy, because it's a much severe cryo. Because the severe cryo can make the much strong adhesion and gradually to uh, make the, the activities uh, regress. And the, and the laser only is for very small one, small and more small microinum. Otherwise, you don't, I don't think laser makes sense doing the with such a giant. 
The some do doctor also uses some suture to suture the fetal vessel during the surgery. It's very technically very difficult. And uh, also, in, uh, according to some other paper, you can see even use the technique or in remove the, the angiomer, they may still encounter some ligands. You know, so I don't like to use the so uh, challenging challenging technique because it's a very young patients. They have very good future. So I try to use a much more in less invasive approach at the first surgery to this one. And you know, the reason why I only use, I don't use a, I don't use a silicone oil. I just use gas. I discuss with the patient several times. If silicone oil can go to the screw much earlier, if you use the gas, you need to face down maybe one one week or stay in home. But I still choose this one. Actually, the lipofil uh, may be much more less than the silicone. Once less under silicone, we made uh, the proliferation. It's very, not easy. At, at least for me, it's not easy to read. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Shima. Fantastic cases. You're welcome. Great cases, Dr. Shima. Really Thank great you. cases. You and, uh, your camera, can you tell me about your camera again? What? Your, your camera. Yeah, your My case. camera? Oh. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a very famous Japan one. I served out, uh, asked by several doctors worldwide. You know, this is Ikegami. Ikegami camera, 4K. I think they also have the branch in the US, in Canada, also in Brazil. I think it's, uh, it's commercial available. It's a 4K camera, high definition 4K camera from Ikegami. Ah, very good. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, Sony is not so bad. Sony cameras are very well. Very yeah. good. I use Sony, yeah. Yeah, it's very lovely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, the next case will be presented by Dr. Gustavo Honey. Dr. Gustavo is a friend from Brazil and an enthusiast for video and cinema. It's a pleasure to have you here, Dr. Gustavo. Can you share your video, please? Sure, of course. First of all, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Hudson, thank you for the invitation. Rafael, thank you for managing the session. It's nice to see old friends and see new friends. Let me just share the screen here. One second, Rafael, and we will have it. Okay, now we are here, here. Let me share it. Can you see the screen? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, so let's go. So this is a case which we had a fallen IOL. So we decided to perform scleral pockets. And what you're going to see in the next moments is that the trocars will be inserted through these pockets. OK, it's a technique I learned with Dr. Potamidis from Cyprus. Here, I'm putting them through the pockets. Then I do an anterior vitrectomy because you know you never know if the iris is uh, if you have vitreous in the iris, then there you can see the IOL. We do a very good vitrectomy, especially a periphery shaving, because it's really easy when you bring the IOL to provoke some retinal ruptures uh, when you grab and you bring it. So you must be gentle. You bring it through the pocket and you already might bring, if you want, the trocar together. You leave it, you adjust the haptics under the pockets because they are safe and make the haptics more stable. Here we suture them to make them close. You can also later close the conjunctiva and it's not often, you. it will be very difficult to have some, some tilting. And this was a case which had a hard cataract. So we, the patient already had before some sutures. I had to cut the sutures out because they were uh, distorting, making some image distortion because the cornea was too tight on the stitches. And that's it, guys. I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Gustavo. Uh, now I'm invited, Dr. Yoshiro. Do you want to comment on this one? Okay, absolutely. So, Gustavo, thank you so much for the uh, beautiful surgery. Fantastic outcome. Um, um, honored to be on the same webinar as everybody here. 
And I just have a question. So um, first, that was a focal period, two focal pyridomies, I assume, not 360. Sorry? Uh, that, those were focal pyridomies, not 360. Those are just a uh, pyridomy, uh, dissection of the conjunctiva over where the uh, trocars were inserted, not 360 degrees. Yeah, that's actually I always try to make three uh, 180. One from that's what you mean. One from the position of the trockers. I didn't get you. Sorry. Oh, I see. Sorry. Aperitomia. Aperitomia. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, the peritomia. Peritomia. Okay, no, no, no. I just dissect the region where I'm going to do the pockets. That's all. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. And then. Um, I saw that the the trocars were didn't seem to be exactly 180 degrees apart, but you were still able to uh, maneuver the lens very nicely without tilt, and it was really nicely centered. Do you think having the pockets there somehow gives you more flexibility? Uh, actually, um, you know, uh, secondary IOL implantation it's my my favorite procedure, as I can see. And when I see some new thing, I'm always trying to do because you know. I was discussing this in another webinar and people were saying, which is the best technique in your way or which one do you like to use? Well, it depends on the mood you have that day. And this day I wanted to try some new thing and I never tried that one. So this was the first case I had with it and I liked it. But nowadays I prefer the, the, the Yamane technique. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you for the questions, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yoshihiro. Uh, so Gustavo, do you want to share uh, Lucan's video? Lucan is a friend and could not be here today because he had a family problem. So okay, give me one second, Rafael, and I will do it for, for you. Let me just, because I have to open the, uh, the file first and then I share the screen. Okay, uh, no problem. Uh -huh. One. I have this video ready here if you want to, but uh, so, if Gustavo, oh, okay. I already have it. Okay, okay. Gustavo, my there is another question here. Uh, which distance from the limbos are you inserting the IOL? Uh -huh. Andre, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question, and I'll let you know. So I do the I do the I dissect the conjunctiva as Dr. Yoshihiro already asked at the region where I'm doing the pockets and the inserting plane is four millimeters from the limbus and I enter the pars plana two millimeters from the limbus okay so you have a distance two and four the pocket the total length of the pocket is two millimeters yeah thank you so now I have Lucan's video ready let's go here So let's go ahead. So this one, let me just play. Can you see it? Yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect. So this was a case where there was a big uh, retinal tear, superior one, and Lucan used um, perflu uh, silicone oil. And at the end, the following day, he said, saw he had some PFO under the retina, as you saw in the in the initial OCT. Okay. So the idea here was to use active aspiration with a 41 gauge needle and the without infusion and leaving the oil. So to try to make it, you don't have to remove all the oil, repeat the procedure. Sometimes you have retinal detachment after re-detachment after that. And the, the trick here is to find the right plane, not touching the RPE. And very gently you pass it and you start with the active uh, aspiration and the secret here is not disparate and having a steady hand because it takes time. Remember the caliper of the, sorry, the, the, the open of the needle is really small and through 41 gauge, it takes a longer time. That's it. After the surgery, there was no PFO under the retina. And that's the follow-up of the case. Yeah, beautiful yeah, surgery, beautiful. Uh, Very good, Gustavo. So I just had a comment. Yeah, I just did they were yesterday exactly subfovial PFCL removal, and uh -huh. somehow the, the this 41 gauge didn't work. So I made a 27 gauge uh, meringotomy knife, made a small nick at the edge, and used the brush, and it came off. Yeah, we also with active uh, aspiration. 
Uh, yes, yes. Good case. Yeah. Good yeah, case. Dr. Lukan is a brave surgeon and really skilled. He's a master. Yeah, yeah. It's a very, very beautiful technique. So, uh, Utsun, do you want to comment on this one? Your mic is off, Utsun. Okay. I was just telling that uh, Lukan is so cool and uh, making videos as well. And uh, we learned a lot from him. And uh, unfortunately, he cannot participate today, but his case is great. I have exactly the same case that I did uh, with the same uh, cannula. We, we, we used this uh, 30 age, 30, 38 gauge. And uh, actually, it narrows down to 41. And under silicone oil, it works pretty good. I don't need to remove the silicone oil such as in this case. Uh, I carry on the vitrectomy, I put the infusion line, very low pressure, very, uh, usually about 20, 15, 20, just to maintain, to keep the eye uh, uh, a little hard. So I go very uh, fast uh, with uh, the 38, 38 candle, the 41 that narrows down, and I remove the uh, before carbon from uh, the uh, subretinal space. And uh, these cannulas that I use from Med1 here, I think they are all over the world, but uh, the distribution here in Brazil is very good from Med1. And uh, it, it's really amazing. And uh, I like doing that technique. Very few times I had to remove the silicone oil, to remove the, uh, the perforo carbon, because I usually don't have uh, much of this complication, but uh, uh, the ones I had, I did not need to remove the uh, silicone oil. Yeah, thank you, Yudson. It's a great video and great technique. Lukan is very, very good surgeon. Uh, so we, we shall proceed to the next one. Dr. Yoshihiro Yonakawa. Dr. Yoshihiro, do you want to share your screen or do you want Hudson to... Yeah. I, I have the uh, video here ready. Uh, I have it shared you. also. Uh, you want to share it? I can share so I can kind of stop and go. As okay, we, okay, sure, sure. Wow. Uh, so uh, this is um, a case of anterior persistent fetal vasculature. So PFV, you can divide into three different types. Anterior, where you only have anterior segment involvement. Posterior, where you have the stalk. And anterior, posterior, that's the classic stalk connecting the disc to the uh, uh, anterior segment. And this is a two-week boy uh, referred for just leukocoria. And here you could see the massive uh, membrane and fibrotic tissue over the pupillary plane. And the most important thing when you have these children is to rule out retinoblastoma. And so we have to be sure we do a good B scan, take a good family history, and take a good look in the other eye also, make sure there's no retinoblastoma. Here, the view is not very good, but we did a good B scan, another clue, is that you can see that the ciliary processes here, uh, I, th I think you can see my, uh, my mouse uh, pointer is yeah. extending towards the center of the eye. That's a clue to PFV as well. And so we're going to uh, fix this eye. And uh, as you can tell, it's a little small, even for the patient's age. And here we're inserting the infusion in the anterior chamber, not in the pars plana. And the reason is because in PFV, uh, a lot of times you can, even if it looks okay on the ultrasound, you can have retina that's very anterior and you don't wanna nick that as you go in, especially here because you don't have a view. If you did have a good view, you can examine the pars plana and do pars plana vitrectomy, but here we don't, so we're not taking any chances. And here we're putting the two other cannulas in the anterior chamber too. You can either do this, which I think uh, I learned this from Phil Ferrone. Uh, it stabilizes the anterior chamber so it doesn't collapse as much. Um, but usually I make a direct, I do a conjunctival dissection and uh, make a sclerotomy at the iris a root anterior chamber. And we have the uh, cutter uh, with very low cut rate, trying to eat away at the membrane. It's very tough. So we use an MVR blade to uh, create the initial plane so that we can get through this thick membrane. And then now we can kind of make our way through. Cutter is working a little bit better uh, once we have an edge. 
and we're approaching this uh, very solid looking uh, mass here and the cutter is uh, not able to eat through. And this is 23 gauge, by the way, just a bigger instrumentation. And so we use scissors uh, to try to cut this membrane off and that works well. And here we're doing a vitrectomy. We don't have to be aggressive here. And this is just a, I like this image a lot. It's a good retro illumination of the, of the round ring that you can see in PFV, uh, which is still contracting the eye together. And we're going to uh, cut this ring uh, because our view is pretty good. And that's my favorite part where you can see the eye kind of snaps open. And here people are different in their opinions about whether to remove this extra tissue or not. Uh, here we are and uh, I'm making a, a point to do good scleral depression here so that we can see everything, make sure we're not cutting and causing traction onto the uh, retina. And that may help prevent regmatogenous complications later on in life. And I always like to finish these cases with air so that there's no vitreous incarceration. And it's good to follow up with uh, fluorescein in these cases. A lot of times these eyes will have peripheral vascular changes. We're not really sure what the implications are of that. Uh, it's often quite mild, but um, it's something that we monitor. And the patient received um, a fake contact lens correction and did very well. Yeah, thank you very much. Beautiful case, Yoshihiro. Uh, now, Dr. Oshima, do you want to comment? Uh, on this one. Ayoshi, great case you did. The perfect. So do you think, what is the, the cutting rate and the bounce you use for this case for the under chamber manipulation? Absolutely. So this was 23 gauge. And when I was cutting the membrane, uh, you know, for regular cases right now, I do 10,000. I think that's wonderful. But to get the really thick tissue, we just kept yeah. going down and down and down and yeah, down. Sure. I think ultimately this was uh, like a uh, thousand or five hundred. <laughs> yeah, I, so, yeah, yeah. Keep going yeah. down, down, down. You know, there are two, two. You know, so, uh, you know, point about this the uh, cutting. You know, previously we just like to drop the crystal lens. We use a very low cutting, that so like you know five hundred, ten thousand. And the one thing, just like you, right, right now we have the dual poles, a very high speed cutter, high speed cutting, the high speed dust spread. Kind of much a small, very small, small debris that aspirated together. So, how about you think? How do you think of what do you think about the twenty-five dual dual port cutter? Do it work for this case? Um, great question. So, I, I like using all gauges, twenty-three, twenty-five, twenty-seven, depending mm -hmm. on the case. And uh -huh. I still have a bias towards if I'm cutting big membranes or if I want really robust instrumentation, I'll do 23 gauge, which tends to be the tougher cases in uh, children's eyes, which is ironic because, yeah. you know, we think of smaller eyes, smaller gauge. And yeah. actually, you know, we're writing a paper together on 27 gauge for pediatric cases. Yeah. And uh, I promise we'll have that written soon. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> We've been working on that for a while now. <laughs> so anyway, in this case, you need to suture the pulse. So just the cornea, cornea wound. Do you need to put a stitch? Uh, yes. So in pediatric eyes, I, I always suture. You never know what the kids are going to do. Uh, yeah. They'll be rubbing their eyes. We don't know if the yeah, parents yeah. can get their uh, the drops in. So subconjunctival antibiotics, if it's a long case, yeah. even betadine on the eye, and always suture, especially if it involves the, the wound involves the cornea. Yeah. Very great job you did. Always learn a lot from your kid case. Thanks so much. Perfect. Thank you. Great comments, Dr. Shima. Now, Dr. Saad Wahib, do you want to comment on this one? Um, sure. Yeah, this is a, a great case. I was just wondering, we spoke about the gauges, uh, um, you know, using 27 uh, in this case, but maybe it's not a good idea because of the thick uh, membranes. Um, and I agree. I think 23 probably works better. The other um, comment I have is I think these kids uh, uh, benefit um, also most when you look at their post-operative visual rehabilitation, as you said, with the use of contact lenses. Otherwise, they get deep ankyliopia. But that's that's a great case. Thank you. Thank you. I definitely agree with working closely with a pediatric ophthalmologist who is very aggressive with um, uh, patching therapy and fixing that ambliopia because anatomically everything looks really good here, and I think we have a good opportunity to give this child good vision. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Beautiful, beautiful case. And 
The next one to present will be Dr. Natarajan. Uh, so Dr. Natarajan, do you have your video here? Yes. Yes. First? Yeah. Yes, I will show. Thank you. So Dr. Natarajan is yes. here from the first Rich and awesome, so he's almost a member of it. Uh, one second. That's okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, uh, can you see my screen now? Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, this is a 65 year old acidophaking male with the history of scleral buckling done two months back and then came with a proliferative retinopathy. Uh, is it here, like this? Is it here? So I, this, I used a 23 gauge uh, 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 vitrectomy in progress. Now, after completing vitrectomy, you can see. There are the multiple retinal holes in all around the periphery. So uh, I think the role of buckle is uh, absolutely not here because whatever I do, and you'll be seeing that the entire retina is uh, contracted because of the intrinsic contraction of the thing. So I'm, I'm trying to work under air. When I do a endodrainage and fluid air exchange through the existing break, you can see the retina is uh, stretching and it's not going behind the uh, the contour of the globe. So that's the reason under air, I do the uh, relaxing retinectomy. And finally, I land up by doing uh, uh, um, cutting the retina 360 degree uh, like this and an irregular shaped retina I get. And the reason I do this is to not to lose much of retina so that this macula and some amount of extra retina is there all around. And you'll be seeing that I'm uh, uh, because of the uh, intrinsic contraction of the retina, the uh, uh, retina not going back. So that's the reason I had to do the uh, relaxing retinectomy. And you can see now the anterior uh, uh, retina, which has PVR, has been cut and removed. And now under the PFCL, I'm doing the endolaser 360 degree to uh, this attached retina. And I actually use heavy oil in those sort of eyes. And at the end of three months, then I remove or if I feel there's a risk of recurrent detachment and I exchange with 5,000 centistrokes oil. You can see the entire uh, retina attached. And uh, you, uh, this uh, patient actually, uh, I think about uh, three months later, I removed the oil and then did the, and this was the picture. You see the steroids in uh, there and the vision around six by 36 was there. I have uh, one more case, similar one. So that's the reason I'm uh, showing the, so here again, uh, you see a, a total retinal detachment with a PVR D3. And now uh, um, you, you're seeing the disc region and then there's a posterior retinal break. And again, I'm uh, doing endodrainage under the, and doing a fluid air exchange. And then uh, make sure that uh, again, under the air, I'm doing the relaxing retinectomy using the diathermy. And here I'm uh, actually cu cutting the retina and then using the cutter to cut the anterior retina so that uh, remove all the anterior retina totally. And all this is because of the uh, intrinsic contracture apart from the uh, anteropost retraction, which is on the surface. After removing the membranes, sometimes the retina does not, you have to go under the, uh, and then uh, use the PFCL, stretch the retina, and then finally make sure that uh, the one, uh, the one of the reason I do under air is because sometimes uh, in case I do under fluid, I've seen the retina curls back and sometimes we, I'm not able to uncurl it at all. So now I'm, uh, I'm doing an air oil exchange and you can see the laser done all around. Thank you. And that's it. And this is the post-op picture of the 6x6 division.
Thank you very much, Dr. Natarajan. Very challenging cases, very difficult cases. And so I want to bring Andre Juca. Do, do you want to comment on this one, Andre? Oh, I think he's off. So Dr. Yoshihiro, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Uh, Natarajan is the master of the most challenging cases. And uh, that was beautiful surgery. And I, I just want to uh, learn a little bit more about the, the rationale and the benefits of doing the uh, anterior retinectomy under air as opposed to doing it under fluid. And um, if you can repeat some of that, uh, those uh, pearls sure. for us. So, so one of the things is that I learned this. I've, I've seen sometimes Steve Charles doing it. One of the things is I can, we can stretch the retina after making sure that all the membranes are removed. And I've not shown the entire thing. It's an edited video. Many times I go back to fluid and see how the retina reacts. And then again, go back under air. And when you when you are 100% sure, you removed all the membranes on the surface of retina and behind the retina. And then I think uh, I, I feel I'm entitled to do a retinectomy, a relaxing retinectomy. Because otherwise, if the membranes are not removed and the whole retina, I think will just get crowded on the disc. So I think under air or other advantages, you can keep the pre air pressure for higher than the fluid, maybe even at 60 for a few seconds and cut the retina. And if you've seen the second case, use the diathermy to cut so that there was no bleeding. And then uh, the slowly the retina falls back. And, uh, and then use the POCL and you can use the retinal massager or the brush to flatten the retina. Thank you so much. I think these cases were a little special too because it's unusual to see this much PVR after a primary buckle. And yeah. uh, so I think these patients probably started with a lot of intrinsic uh, retinal uh, PVR as well. And yes. so, yeah, these techniques are wonderful. Thank you for teaching us this. Thank you. Uh, I also want to comment on this case. Uh, I love to do lasers, especially after air fluid exchange. It seems that with the wide angle vitrectomy viewing systems, you see the whole periphery a lot better. So sometimes yeah. you have a hole, Natarajan, in the very far periphery. You cannot reach it during the vitrectomy, even though you make identification, you use wide angle lenses. But uh, if you do some laser that is not quite enough, after effluid exchange, you put the lens, you see a lot more from the, out of the periphery. So great yes. case, you know, and uh, these cases are really challenging. <laughs> yes, yes. And I like to, I decided now, now onwards, I do only complicated cases. I don't want to do simple cases anymore. Thank so you. I yes. I, I just wanted to comment too, uh, great case and, and great results. And I too, Hudson, love the peripheral view that air affords, obviously. However, in cases like this, when I'm doing a 360 retinectomy for a terrible PVR like this, I'm, I'm worried about the retina slipping when we're putting in the oil. And, and lately what I've enjoyed doing more than using air is using perfluorocarbon, doing the um, retinectomy under perfluorocarbon and we can in real time really see how much of the traction we've relieved and how much more we need to relieve. And then just going directly to a perfluorocarbon silicone oil exchange and avoiding air at all. Just, I find there's virtually no chance of slippage and it's just a very much more controlled scenario yeah. for me. I wonder what other people Excellent, thought. excellent point, Robert. I think we had to probably many cases I do with PFCL and I specifically selected because some patients like this, I don't know how to classify which one to use PFCL and which one to use here. But I think one of the things is I, I, when I use PFCL in the first case, I think the PFCL went every time subretinal. So I decided instead of using PFCL, I'll do everything under air. And I did a fluid air exchange, make sure the retina was flat. And then use the oil by putting the first drop of the oil pouring in front of the optic disc so there was no slippage. I agree with you. And I think that's the reason in giant retinal tear with a like with a fl uh, floating retina, it's easy to do a P PFCL oil exchange because everything is under excellent visualization. So I think I have to probably think more to write specifically which case only to use PFCL and which case you should switch yeah. over to. I think it's a, very, a valid point. 
maybe i'm writing a book on like principle and practice of surgery which i which is a surgery which i think i have to segregate this good very good point to think yeah thank you very much for the comments dr robert deveni so dr robert you're the next one do you want to share your video or now do we, uh, i have uh, dr deveni's video here and uh let me share it now. It's uh, really cool, Dr. Deveni. This video was amazing. Uh, I tried to cut it a little bit, but no, everything is, is so important. Can, can you see the, uh, the screen right now? Okay, yeah. I will, I'll, I'll start it. So it's going on. So I think this was just quickly showing the indications, which we all know for the Argus implant for patients with retinitis pigmentosa with light perception or worse uh, vision. And uh, this was one of our first cases actually. It's, it's really fun surgery and technically quite challenging. Here's where the uh, band is just being sutured into place. You can see the ribbon reflected anteriorly onto the cornea. As I said, these are virtually the only buckles I ever do. <laughs> and they're big buckles, huge buckles. The, the, the electronics of these Argus implants are very large and one really has to take care to cover them properly. Otherwise they'll erode through the conjunctiva. There's the array of 60 electrodes now on the ribbon. One has to be very careful not to use regular instruments because it'll damage electronics. We use only silicone tipped instruments to handle all electronic components. There's the array reflected on the um, cornea before it's inserted now through a very large six millimeter incision. It's inserted through the sclera. I use, again, soft-tipped instruments, typically a soft-tipped extrusion needle to um, uh, manipulate the array. And then with this titanium tack, it's tacked into place. And, and as you can see there, the goal is to tack it onto the um, central macula. And that's the most stressful part of the surgery because one really has only one chance. This isn't quite in sequence. This is now securing the electronics there onto the retina. This is again showing the array being inserted with silicone tip forceps into the sclerotomy. And again, the tacking is the most stressful part. A lot of surgeons Younger surgeons don't have experience with tacks. We used to use them a long time ago, not very successfully for retinal detachments and everyone has abandoned them, but the technique remains as a, as a good technique. Now, because the electronics are so huge, we can't just close the conjunctiva over it. We use irradiated, irradiated pericardium called tutoplast to cover the um, electronics before closing the conjunctiva to avoid extrusion. This is showing, this is a video showing how three months later, this was our first patient. She was able to identify these, these squares very successfully. You can see her pushing on them. This was just a test that she failed miserably on preoperatively. And it was really a very emotional, positive time for her to be able to suddenly see these things. Every time she pushes it, she gets this positive reinforcement from the computer. And then one week later, you can see on the OCT there how the electrodes were flat against the surface of the retina. And that's the kind of position we want. We don't want it to overlap on the disc. We want it just to cover the macula. 
These are several cases, I guess, that are being shown here. That's another one, good position. Amazingly, these are tolerated extremely well. Yeah, this one patient developed 20 over 160 vision. And she was able to, she wrote me a thank you card with letters about one inch. Uh, uh, and she was, it really changed her life. There's another one. It's super, super fun surgery to do. And it really incorporates all aspects of everything we do. You can see it, it's really very well tolerated despite the huge buckle. They're really hardly swollen postoperatively. Tragically, one of the patients that I did uh, an Argus on just died of COVID, which is such a shame. Again, that's the first post-op day. They're hardly swollen at all. There's the first nine or 10 of his. Yeah, so the visual rehabilitation starts about four weeks post-op and that's really a big deal. This was the letter this one lady wrote me. She wrote me that thank you letter. It's pretty amazing. She was light perception preoperatively. We did apply and were successful. Yeah, this lady became quite a celebrity in Toronto, was really even in the local magazines. <laughs> so the big question is what is the future? When when these slides were put together, the hope was that that these implants would keep improving and the sensitivities would keep improving and the software would enable facial recognition and color, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is that the economics are such that the company is basically unable to continue, at least at the present time, It's just such an expensive endeavor. In Canada, in Germany, some countries, we were able to get funding, I believe in Saudi Arabia too. Um, but overall they're, they're, it was a very expensive endeavor and uh, they really ran into financial problems as have virtually all companies making these retinal implants. Yeah, thank you very much, Robert. Fantastic job, fantastic results. Uh, and mainly this changed patients' life. That's what we are seeking. So, uh, Utson, do you want to comment on this one? Yeah, Dr. Deveni, I get almost uh, emotional when I watch these videos, especially this video from this woman from India. You know, this is amazing. I can't believe that uh, surgery is going to stop. I don't know. I remember when uh, I did a retinal fellowship with you and uh, Dr. Lam, uh, we had this uh, macular translocation buckle system uh, uh, surgery it went on for a while and then after some uh, years, it was discontinued. And uh, I think we still have uh, some application for that, but uh, uh, talking uh, just comparatively with the Argus 2, do you think the Argus 2 could have a, a future, a better future now, but, uh, or because of the laboratories or other economical problems, it might stop? I think it's very interesting. You know, there, there's good and bad when private industry becomes involved in medicine. In a lot of ways, it's very good because competition breeds uh, progress and people try and outdo others and we get better and better um, development. However, it also means that the bottom line is very important and that if the finances are, uh, are such, then it just doesn't continue despite their their role, and I think that's what we're really seeing here. The, the main uh, 
financier for Second Sight who literally gave them tens of millions of dollars essentially sealed their fate because he wants them to not concentrate on the Argus, but to concentrate on the Orion, which is the, the, the group of electrodes that they don't place on the retina, but they place on the occipital cortex. And the rationale is the Argus is good for patients who have an intact optic nerve and an intact eye. The Orion theoretically is good for all patients who are blind. So this guy being a business guy and being an investor and having various personal reasons why he's so invested in blindness has dictated essentially that that's the direction they should go. As to whether the Orion will ever prove useful, I don't know. As a lot of people probably know, they have done a few Orions in the world, essentially as a proof of principle, just to ensure that at least by electrically stimulating the brain, epileptic seizures aren't being induced. Um, and, and the patients do see some vision, some light sensations. The challenge, of course, will be to enable some sort of um, spatial orientation and some sort of useful images. And whether that'll happen, that still remains to be seen. I'm personally pretty skeptical, uh, not to mention it's a, a much more dangerous endeavor to be drilling into the head and, and putting electrodes onto the brain and, and us implanting into the eye. So, where that'll go, I personally wouldn't be wanting to invest any money into that, but we'll see where it goes. Yeah, yeah, very cool. And I uh, just want to welcome Dr. Wai-Chin Lam, also my professor as uh, Dr. Rob Diveni. And uh, I want to know whether Dr. Lam uh, wants to comment on uh, Dr. Diveni's case for Argus 2. Dr. Wai-Chin Lam just uh, came in. And, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, I came late. Hi, hi Rob, hi. and uh, hi. hi, Saad. And um, I think the hour difference between Hong Kong and Brazil got me mixed up. <laughs> and um, anyway, I think the, the um, Argus 2 is an amazing uh, tool for, uh, for the patients, and it has allowed uh, great mobilities for those patients. And it's too bad that um, it doesn't uh, get to keep the, keep carry on because the company has decided it is not uh, commercially uh, favorable for them. But uh, I've seen uh, Dr. Divinley operate on those uh, patients. And I also see them being trained to use the device and it has uh, a uh, incredible result for those individuals who otherwise would be totally uh, uh, disabled, unable to ambulate and able to do a lot of the things that the devices allow them to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, ask one quick question. Um, Rob, um, I read with interest the uh, publication that your group, the Argus Consortium, published about a year ago or a couple of months ago about the rates of complications. And the uh, complication rates were uh, much less in the real world after approval compared to the clinical trials. And I always wondered, what, what kind of modifications did you guys make? Um, I think a lot of it is experience too. Um, you know, and, and some centers, we got very quick at it. I think uh, my fastest one was just over an hour. Some centers, they took nine hours. And obviously, the, the quicker the surgery, the less likely I think you're going to get complications and just go and do the job and, and get out of there as quickly as possible. I think in terms of the initial cases versus later cases, the biggest change was the, the tutoplast, that irradiated pericardium that was um, placed over the large portions of the hardware before closing the conjunctiva. And, and that honestly took the longest part. It was like doing fine meticulous oculoplastic surgery, just placing these pieces and, and suturing them down to really cover all the portions. But that virtually eliminated extrusion because I think that was the biggest, biggest issue. Uh, there weren't any major complications otherwise. There were a couple cases of detachment and hemorrhage and I think maybe one end off the mitis, but they were comparatively very rare. Um, the, the, the worst, complication I had in my patient was a, a very upset patient because after about three years, her implant just stopped working. 
uh, it literally stopped working. The engineers did not know why. The intraocular portion could no longer communicate with the extraocular portion and the image could not be sent. And there was one or two other cases like that reported as well. Um, not that it's a huge surprise. There's no other piece of electronics that we buy in life that we expect has zero chance to malfunction. The problem is when this electronics happens to be implanted in someone's eye and it malfunctions, after it had changed their lives, they're very unhappy. And it's not a trivial endeavor to try and take one of these out and put another one in. So uh, it was an, uh, an amazing device um, with some but rare complications for sure. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Robert. Uh, Dr. Marcelo Murillo Sasamoto, do you want to comment on this one? Yes, um, my, my comment is uh, that I, I think uh, one year ago, I, have a, a conversation, I had a conversation with Rajat Agarwal, one of the creators of the Argus One, I believe. And uh, he desire was to uh, have a Argus, uh, a, low, uh, a low cost Argus for people in India. So uh, he told me that maybe the future uh, 10,000 cost uh, per Argus would be a great. But my question is, um, uh, during this uh, consideration that uh, Robert made, do you think in the future would be possible to have uh, this Argus 2 uh, a low cost for, for all the, uh, the people who want it or who need it? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm... I think the problem is it's such an expensive endeavor, not so much to make one of these implants, but to support it and to facilitate advancement. For every case that we did, Second Sight would send typically two engineers to come during the case and monitor the progress. And then not to mention the whole post-operative process of um, uh, fitting the implant to the patients electronically and then the, the whole rehab portion, it's all very expensive and very labor intensive. You know, for example, the first step post implantation at about a month is that each of those 60 electrodes has its threshold determined such that the electrical stimulus keeps being increased until the patient can see it. And it's done so in sequence for each of the 60 electrodes. And then software is, is written specifically for that patient. And, and then the next step is the whole rehab process. So it's it's so much more than the development of the implant and the manufacture of the implant. It's, there's, there's a lot of steps and it's, it's just expensive. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, even at 190,000 Canadian dollars, they couldn't make this endeavor work financially. So I don't know how a $10,000 implant yeah. in terms of all the other costs would be viable, but maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. The fantastic cases. And so the next one will be Dr. Vilhab Sadi. Do you want to share a screen, Dr. Sadi? Sure. Dr. Sadi, do you hear me? Yes, I can okay. hear you. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Can you see the video, please? Yeah, perfect. OK. So, so this was a case of vitro macular attraction of an old lady and uh, in the right eye. So basically, in all cases of vitromacular traction, I go ahead and strain it with uh, triumphs and lol, and uh, that really helps me to delineate the uh, posterior hyaloid very well. So in this case, I'm showing you because uh, I had a difficulty in uh, basically peeling off the posterior hyaloid uh, to basically to raise the traction. So here you can see I'm trying to shave off the, uh, the cortical nucleus all across, all around the uh, adherent posterior hyaloid. So uh, basically I'm, I'm avoiding any anterior posterior movement because that can actually create a macular hole. So uh, I'm trimming the vitreous cortex all around and there's a adherent uh, posterior hyaloid 
at the macula as well as in the peripapillary area. So after clearing off the tricot and uh, increasing the vacuum to around 500, 600, and doing a 23 gauge vitrectomy, and uh, still not being able to find a proper cleavage plane below this area so that I can peel off the uh, posterior hyoid. So I try now to create a cleavage plane between the disc and the uh, macular area. Here I'm able to create some amount of cleavage plane through which I am aiming to go through. And I'm just trying to just check whether I'm in the right space or not. So here I could see that I'm, I'm holding the posterior hyaluron and trying to create a PVD, but I, I stopped there because uh, if I, if I uh, do too much of anterior posterior traction, it will lead to a macular hole formation. So now I go back again. And uh, now fortunately I do get a cleavage plane all around. And uh, here you can see, I'm just with the cutter, I'm able to open up the pylon and basically atraumatically release the traction. And to be on the safer side, I do always go ahead and peel the ILM as well in uh, all the vitro macular traction patients for my own satisfaction. So that uh, that confirms the proper uh, clearance of the traction as well as in case I've created an, an inadvertent macular hole, this will uh, help me in uh, treating that as well. And I end up putting air or gas depending on the case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sethi. Uh, Dr. Rachinlan, do you want to comment on this one? Sorry, uh, I uh, actually, I missed the, the video. I, I couldn't see it properly. So uh, um, I, I think you have to pass the content for, for that. Sorry. No problem. Dr. Natarajan, do you want to comment on this one? Yeah, no, I think a, a excellent uh, point. And I think you have to be aware of uh, like the uh, happening of macular hole. And I think we had also discussed with the patient before. I think, he, as he mentioned, uh, automatically induced PVD using the cutter instead of using the anthroposter suction in the beginning and I used steroid uh, stain and also did a ILM peeling without complication. And I think uh, it's important because we have to know that the macular hole is one of the complications and which I think we have to prevent it. I think why we have done a good surgery. Great. Thank you very much. Dr. Vasco Bravo, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, uh, it's a nice case. I think the, it is a really good approach. Uh, sometimes we have these vitreous really attached, and I think Dr. Sethi was very carefully, and he did the right choice doing this. Um, the the treason alone helps a lot on those cases for sure, and I think he performed really well. I think we have to take care sometimes, mainly for the the younger, the fellows, sometimes they go like, oh, vitreous macular traction, let's detach the vitreous. Uh, but we have to be really careful in those cases. And we can't be so, so, so hungry as when we try to detach the vitreous when we perform a retinal detachment or, or another type of vitrectomy that we can be more, more strongly, uh, have a more strongly approach for vitreous detachment. Thank you very much. Uh, so shall we proceed with Dr. Saad Wahib? Do you wanna share your screen for the next case? Sure, sure. Um, I'd like to um, first start by thanking um, Dr. Nakamura for this beautiful chance he given me uh, not only to uh, see everybody, but also to connect with uh, old friends, Dr. Waishin Lam and Dr. Robert Devenier. Me and Dr. Nakamura, we did uh, our fellowship together, and I'm not going to say how long ago, Hudson. I'll just keep it uh, between both of us. So before I start... I'm, long time start. ago, long time. <laughs> so th this, this was a case that was sent to me for a second opinion. He's a younger guy. He's actually a football player in one of the famous uh, football matches here in Saudi Arabia. And um, he was referred with this history of dropped uh, vision for... Uh, when I saw him, it was almost two months. Uh, he does report a history of transient exposure to one of these handheld uh, laser pointers. It was very brief, um, very uncomfortable, and then his vision dropped over a week, over one week. When I saw him, his left eye, which is the affected eye, was counting finger, 
normal anterior segment examination. And this is how his fundus uh, looked like. You can see the full thickness uh, macular hole. I've, I've gone into the habit of doing OCTA for these patients uh, lately because, uh, um, you know, the recent reports talk about uh, OCTA biomarkers in the form of the fast zone and the cystic changes in the um, in, in the deep vascular um, uh, plexus that can be prognostic factors. Uh, this is just again showing you the hole, which actually looks uh, like it's moderately large, uh, with the classical um, um, uh, edema at the edges and the uh, subfoveal hyperreflectivity, which is usually seen in these cases. Um, and when you look at the size of the hole, there are different ways of measuring the size. Um, you know, you can either look at the apical or the basal or the narrowest. And um, you know, uh, he's 550, so he's uh, considered a moderate, uh, moderately sized hole. And at that stage. Um, the previous um, uh, retina surgeons that I've seen have ex um, advised him to wait for at least uh, two or three months. And I said to him, there's a chance that it might spontaneously close, but I think it's very small. And I, I did advise surgery for him. So this was a 25 gauge uh, vitrectomy uh, using the constellation. Um, um, I do agree with the previous speaker. You want to induce PVD. I, I use trimcinolone, but I think I must have used a little bit too much here. Uh, in the young people, you want to watch for difficult um, high load um, uh, induction, and sometimes you have to restain, restain again. And you want to be patient, give it some time, allow it, the, the vitreous to hydrate. And I think with patience, um, and the fact that you, you, you make sure you have a good uh, grasp on the hyaloid or the opening, and then you can see how you can induce uh, the posterior hyaloid detachment. Now, the question is how far anterior you want to take it. I don't think in macular hole, it really matters that you want to take these cases anteriorly. And then after that, you stain. Um, I stained with membrane blue. And um, the idea is to um, do an ILM peel. In this case, um, I decided to do the uh, macular sparing. Um, ILM, and you can see I'm trying to start the caps, the uh, rexus of the um, ILM. Uh, you can certainly use the uh, Fennis loop. I, I feel comfortable with the forceps. I used to do uh, bigger ILM um, peels, but now I'm doing smaller ones, uh, trying to save ILM just in case if uh, I have to come back. I shortened this with the cutter. Now, a uh, tip uh, when you do that, uh, please lower the vacuum, otherwise you can pull the whole ILM. And then after that, uh, once you've done uh, the, uh, the uh, trimming of the ILM, you do an air fluid exchange, which I've done. Um, um, you, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not trying to stuff the, uh, the membrane into the hole. I don't like to do that, but I'm just trying to make sure the ILM is on the, um, on the hole. And um, I, I used uh, SF6, 20%, uh, but I, I would think air would probably be also sufficient. I usually bring these patients within two to three days. I think if they're going to close, they will usually close after two to three days. And we're lucky with this patient and his vision has actually improved. And this is one week post-operative uh, picture showing improvement of the visual acuity. His IOP was a little bit uh, high and that's, um, this is I think because I used a bit too much of trimcinolone, but within a month, uh, his IOP came back to normal. His vision came actually to 20, 40. And I think um, if you look at the uh, different OCTs, I think with time, the macular structure tend to come back, the um, external limited membrane, the ellipsoid zone, and the uh, photoreceptor outer segment, I think, is going to grow uh, in these cases uh, with time. Uh, just one final word on the use of these uh, high power high head lasers. I'm not sure how is the situation um, you know, in your country, but in my country, it's easier. You can buy these things um, over the internet. Uh, teenagers and kids can get them and they can play with them just like this uh, unfortunate guy. And I think we need more restriction. So I think that concludes my case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Saad. Uh, I would like to bring Dr. Gustavo Honey. Do you want to comment on this one, well, my friend? Absolutely, absolutely. First of all, I want to say congratulations, congratulations to Dr. Wahib. It's a beautiful and very rare case because the macula was burned. And usually when you think about traumas in football players, you expect to be through uh, an impact or the ball or something like that. Uh, the only thing which uh, is my humble opinion, sorry, uh, I would do the posterior, posterior hyaloid detachment as much as I could. That's the only different thing I would do. And another thing in young patients, I don't think you had too much triencinolone. The opposite, you did it rightly. 
because it's really difficult to detach this uh, hyaloid in young people. So, and it is easier, like you did in your video, to use the bursa premacularis to detach the hyaloid. Congratulations, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Gustavo. For, for, for the first question, um, um, I, I thought I used too much tramcinolone because the IOP of the patient um, went up in the first uh, two weeks or so. Um, and then it, it's interesting you say that because uh, uh, we have um, uh, unfortunate high number of these cases. I think uh, there are a few papers published in this range. And I think one of the biggest paper came from uh, King Khalid Riyadh uh, with the highest number of uh, laser, handheld laser induced uh, macular hole injury. So um, yeah, I'm very hopeful we can um, get this thing controlled soon. Thank you. And just to answer your question, sorry, it is also really easy to hear in Brazil at least to buy these lasers, but so far, and thanks God, I never had a case like that. Congrats again. Thanks. Uh, and uh, uh, Sad, I think uh, you can use and use a steroid so that I think you don't have to use much steroid. Probably just circulate and go to uh, some and uh, small advice in case you uh, see um, that the uh, particles uh, are being the angle. Uh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I lost you. Uh, no, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, I think Dr. Natarajan is having a connection problem. So if I may, uh, if I may give a suggestion to Nati, because his sound is chopped, he can type the question. It would be easier, I think. Yeah, yeah. And we can pass it through Dr. Wahab. I think what Dr. Nataraja was saying is that the residual uh, transcendental inside the eye may actually has helped the recovery by reducing the amount of inflammation and um, potentially the, the extra transcendental that was used um, actually has this anti-inflammatory property that may have helped the healing of the macular hole in this case. I'm not sure whether uh -huh. that's true or not, but uh, that's one possible uh, kind of proposal. Great, great to hear this um, from you, Dr. Lam. One, th one thing I wanted to say to Gustavo, as far as um, inducing the PVD, um, I, think, I think it's a bit controversial because um, uh, maybe in, in a diabetic, you probably want to go as far anterior as you want, but I thought in macular holes, because the disease is very posterior now, you can certainly induce the um, uh, PVD um, anterior, and you can go with the hyaloid anteriorly, but then you're worried about creating peripheral breaks. So um, I think there's a there's a balance between both, but um, um, I think both both ways are correct. And if I may give you another suggestion, I know it's bit, it's a little bit difficult because football players chain move a lot. If you can do a long follow up of of this patient in the future, share it again. I would love it. Thank you so much. Sure, sure. He's been he's been actually six months. Um, he's he wants to go back uh, to play. I've been holding him. Uh, he's uh, he's a famous uh, football player. Um, but I mean, I would. Um, you think you think he should go back to to play? I, I wanted to ask what, what, what the panel think. Should he go back to play? He's uh, um, he's a very active uh, guy, and you know uh, I think he's worth a lot. So that's why they were concerned about him. Uh, I've been keeping him off. Uh, you know, um, playing uh, for now six months. So would that be a good idea? Should I should I continue holding him or should he go back? What do you think? After three months, I would set him free. Really? Okay. I, I think uh, eye protection will be very important going forward. He doesn't want to do that. I did suggest this to him. Um, he doesn't want to wear any goggles and he said he, does, he doesn't look well with them. He's a very handsome. <laughs> So, so it's not easy, trust me, when you deal with these people. <laughs> what is his final visions now? What is his security that I, I, I he, he He's not in my city. I, I've, been, um, I've been getting um, his OCTs from, um, I, I've just got the, his um, three month OCT. Uh, his visual acuity is 2040, 2050. Uh, okay. Now he's, he's fine, his pressure is okay. Uh, um, I, think, uh, and he, I think he's probably ready. I did suggest for him to wear protective, uh, uh, glasses or goggles when he goes back, but he said uh, he doesn't want to do that. So um, yeah. I think I, you can I, explain it to him though that uh, if you get hit, that hole that hole may open up again, and the uh, no. protective you know what, you know, goggles no, may have to. What, 
what I'll do, Dr. Lam, I'll set him free. If something goes wrong, I'll send him to Gustavo. <laughs> yes, good idea. <laughs> as long you. as he doesn't score own goals, it's okay. <laughs> well, one small thing about Triamcin alone is that uh, in a vitrectomy side, I maybe uh, the anti-inflammatory effect is almost two to three days. So just a comment. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much for your case, Dr. Saad. Uh, so we shall move to our next presenter, which is Vasco Bravo from Brazil. Hello, okay. Vasco. You want to share your screen, Vasco? Yeah, sure. Just All right, sharing. Vasco. I had this uh, connection problem here. The internet is so strong, but I don't know what happened, and I skipped for a while. Oh, that's right. And if you could share, it would be yeah. Can you can you see my my screen? That is perfect. Thank you. Okay. Vasco. So first, thanks again, Hudson, Rafael, and everybody. It's a great pleasure being with a, such amazing team. And here I'm going to present a, a case of a male, 24 years old, that had a trauma with an iron material on December 2017. But he came for another friend of mine that is a cataract surgery, a cataract surgery uh, to perform uh, the cataract since they had a this and so we decided to perform ultrasound, UBM, and all this thing. And it had it, UBM. You can see the intraocular foreign body very tight, very very close to the the, the wall, and anteriorly placed, uh, close to plana, around plana. He when he came, uh, so we lost his follow up and a little bit, and then he came was 2,400, and uh, the cognitive was quiet. Uh, we couldn't see a lot of, uh, of details in the, in the fundoscopic, and uh, no flare, everything was okay, but had the capsular, uh, the serocapsular cataract, <laughs> because of, unfortunately, due to insurance problems that didn't wanna, allow the surgery together with a retinal surgery because the cataract, my friend that performed cataract surgery talked with me and we decided to make a surgery together. So we had the delay. And so in January he came, he was light perception. So he had a complete cataract. And so this was the ultrasound, the B scan in 2018. And then when he came, we can see that we have increased in inflammatory uh, findings and we had to perform the surgery and thanks God the insurance approved the surgery. So here is the, the cataract friend that performed the surgery. You can see a lot of pigments in the, in the capsule, but the cataract was very soft and it went so okay. We implant the intraocular lens and then we performed the, the vitreous, the vitrectomy. They had already the uh, posterior detachment. Uh, we can see that the had some inflammatory, some opacities in the vitreous. So we performed a complete vitrectomy, started to review, and we found the intraocular foreign body. I perform, I implant uh, perfluorocarbon on those cases because I think it's good to help. The intraocular foreign body was not too big. Uh, before I remove, I removed the trocar and increased the, the sclerotomy. Uh, however, when I removed the intraocular foreign body, uh, it didn't came complete. It kind of had a disintegration. So I realized that had some disintegration and I realized that I could actually remove most of them with the vitrectomy. Uh, also, on those cases that are small, you can use the back flush to help positioning better the intraocular foreign body. So I could remove everything. I, we had some like tiny pieces still attached to the wall. Uh, we removed everything from the review, we still had a little tiny piece that we removed. Uh, we had some of the, there was attached in the sclerotomy when I removed it. And then use it as I mentioned, uh, it had some inter, you know, ILM folds. I decided to perform the ILM peeling. I know that is controversial if I had should be done this or not. Unfortunately, I don't have OCT intraoperatively, so it would help a lot. And I decided to perform laser on the area that we had the, the intraocular foreign body. 
after that, uh, this is the OCT, three month surgery. The patient was amazingly like 2025 20, with this residual uh, refraction. And he was really, really happy. And that's it. Okay, Vasco, thank you very much. Uh, just to comment on this one, I saw a case, I think last week from a Russian guy, I don't remember his name. He had a uh, similar uh, intraocular foreign body. He, he had the cataract surgery, but he didn't implant the lens, had a posterior capsular axis, then removed the intraocular foreign body and then implanted the lens uh, in the capsular bag. It, it is an option. Uh, I think you did great, but it, it is an alternative. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Waiting man to comment on this. Sure. Can I confirm? Is, is that foreign body metallic? Yeah, it is. Yes. So, so amazingly, it get as you saw, like kind of disintegration due to the time, yeah. maybe. Yeah, possibly the time yeah. certainly could could have done it. Um, using a rare earth magnet may help to facilitate the uh, the removal, especially bringing up to the mid. Uh, which is cavity and transfer to the forceps. Using the soft tip, sometimes when you bring it out from the scrotomy, uh, it may dislodge and fall back to the, uh, to the eye. But I think you done it beautifully with the, uh, um, the soft tip, removing the small fragments and, uh, um, and clean up very nicely. So, uh, uh, but since it's, it's metallic, the uh, rare earth method may be uh, useful to uh, keep that, that uh, metal form body in one place and then you can remove them in, the, in total. But remember that don't try to remove it with the method itself because as the uh, instrument comes out from the scrotum side, especially if you have taken out the choker, uh, it may get caught and then get trapped in the uh, uh, richer space and then it will be even harder to remove it. And I agree with you that it's a good idea to laser the impact site because that could be a the retinal break with the impact. So, but wonderfully done, beautiful surgery. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, unfortunately I don't have the magnet. So because of that, I also decided in those cases, I always perform the plethorocarbon like to protect the fovea in case of when I remove it and it drops so I can protect the, the macula. I just want to say, I, I agree with Wai Ching. When the metallic intraocular body is embedded into the retina, I think it's much easier and much gentler and much safer to elevate it with a rare earth magnet as opposed to grabbing with forceps and, and risking further trauma to the retina, which is already likely torn. So I like to, like Wai Ching, lift it up with the magnet. It's very gentle. And then mid vitreous transferring it to the uh, intraocular form body forceps and then taking it out through a very generously enlarged uh, sclerotomy to avoid potentially not getting it out easily yeah. or getting it stuck somewhere where it's very difficult to see. I think there are also uh, two other interesting points to this uh, really cool case that you showed. Uh, one was, uh, this was delayed removal of the IOFB. Usually IOFB, we're trying to operate within 24 hours. Yeah. to decrease the risk for endophthalmitis. But the eye was really clean, no signs of any bugs anywhere. So I'm not sure if we truly know the rates of endophthalmitis after these types of injuries. And there's a lot of data uh, from uh, the military uh, showing that high speed metallic objects will have lower rates of endophthalmitis, but in civilian injuries, we're not really sure. Uh, we take, you know, we try to be safe and intervene as early as possible, but uh, I think that's a great point that you make with this case. And the second is, this was a metallic, presumably, uh, you know, iron uh, piece of metal, and we worry about siderosis. And I'm not sure about everyone's experience about loss of visual function with siderosis and how, how quickly that happens. Uh, but I think um, even with good central acuity, sometimes you'll have peripheral vision loss and nyctalopia. Uh, so examining the functional vision with you know, also ERG and stuff like that may be interesting uh, for follow-up visits. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, unfortunately, he's from a countryside area and like since then I, I don't see him. Sometimes he sends some message saying that he's okay, uh, but that's it. 
Okay, as long as he's happy, that's good. Exactly, exactly. Uh, actually, by the way, in the beginning, when he came first for, for us, and I saw we didn't have the UBM, I, I even I couldn't see the forward body. And I even said to the, the Catholic surge, look, let's do it together. Maybe I'm going to do a uh, fundoscopic intraperitoneal uh, during the surgery. And if we need, we do the vitrectomy. But after he came in, we see all that uh, ultrasound findings and all the increase in the cataract. I said, look, for sure, we have to perform vitrectomy this this isn't the catheter, uh, vitreous cavity for sure. And then, thanks God, was and everything then, okay? The Yoshio's comment about uh, endophthalmitis, I think any metal foreign body, when it comes with the velocity, it generates some heat and usually they don't have endophthalmitis. And we have seen patients coming a few weeks later, nothing happens. But I think non-metallic foreign body, when they have, I think, high risk of endophthalmitis. Yeah. And, uh, and this is what I've seen even in Kashmir with a lot of pellet injury more than 1,000 people, but I think end of term, it was not there at all because of the velocity. Yeah, thank you. Very beautiful case, Dr. Vasco. Thank you. Maybe this foreign body could be seen at a CT scan? Uh, maybe. We didn't perform the CT scan because we, we had the, the UBM that we could really see it well. Uh, and he didn't have any other big trauma in a, uh, orbit or something like that. So we didn't realize the CT due to that. Okay. Thank you very much. Very beautiful. Just, just going to say, yeah, just a, even just a plain X-ray may be able to pick up uh, metal yeah. because metal has a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, show up well on, on the, on the, uh, the X-ray. Yeah. Yeah. I think in, in rural India, we use x-ray. We I always tell them, take an x-ray and send it so that you know whether the intraocular or x-ray and whether it's a radio-opaque foreign body. So I think x-ray is definitely the basic thing which is available in every every place. Yeah, I think it's very well said this uh, about the x-ray and other image because sometimes we sometimes we cannot find the ultra, by ultrasound or something depending on the type of the intraocular foreign body or depending on who is doing the, the ultrasound, that is a very dynamic uh, examination. So I always say to the fellows in the resident, look, if we have an intro, a suspicious of a trauma with intraocular foreign body and you can't find, you see a wound or something, we have to perform x-ray or something like this, even for legal purpose to, to resist, make a registration of the, the, the absence or the presence of this intro, uh, intraocular foreign body. Thank you very much, Dr. Vasco. Very challenging case, mainly because the patient had one year after yeah. the visit. So it's a, it's a Brazilian problem. And yeah. Okay. Uh, if, if he were in the public system, probably he would have done very fast. But unfortunately, he was in the private. And the insurance was making trouble for that. Yeah, yeah. That is just confusing, right? Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, now I'm going to call Dr. Weiqing Lam. Dr. Weiqing, do you want to present your case now? Okay. So um, I'm going to show you a case, uh, interesting case that uh, I handled a few years back. Uh, the patient referred because of a dislocated in chocolate lens implant. But uh, it's not only just that, it, the, the whole implant with the capsular back was dislocated. And in viewing the history, uh, the, in, in the uh, cataract surgery, um, there was phacodonesis. And uh, so um, there was some uh, kind of uh, weak zonules and uh, they put in a capsular retention ring for the, uh, for the surgery. And uh, were able to complete the surgery with the IOL in place, and then uh, a few years later, the uh, the whole uh, thing dislocated. So you can see on on the video that you can see the capsule, the uh, one single piece uh, tinted IOL with a uh, with the capsule retention ring. You can just see it there. So I set out the surgery thinking, okay, I'm going to uh, remove the uh, the capsule, remove the lens fragment and then figure out how to take out the uh, capsule retention ring and the one piece IOL. And uh, so I start taking out that uh, 
part of the cortex. And uh, then I have something um, come to my mind. I said, maybe I don't have to take this all out. So um, I don't have to cut it and I can maybe just suture this in place. So what I did next is to uh, uh, use the uh, uh, cutter to elevate the uh, intraocular lens implant and then uh, using a tenopoline to suture the uh, IOL implant into the sulcus. And the reason why it's possible is that the whole capsule is still very intact and is holed up with the capsule retention ring. You can see the tenopoline needle was passed through uh, underneath the capsule retention ring. And then uh, I did another uh, pass with a 25 gauge needle as a guide to uh, allow the insertions of the tenopoline needle. And um, this is a, uh, a uh, double armed tenopoline so that, uh, so when I pull the uh, suture up, then this will engage the haptic. And, uh, and then I can secure that uh, with the, uh, the tenopoline. So uh, you can see the, the tenopoline is passed underneath and above the, uh, uh, the capsule retention ring, which is still holding the capsule nicely in place. And then I just pull that up. And, um, and that, so that secured this side. And I re basically repeat that same on the, on the, um, uh, the nasal side, the temporal side, and uh, just because of the time, I can show you quickly. So we did also for the other side and doing exactly the same thing and uh, docking the needles through uh, with a 25 gauge needle guided through the other end, uh, about one and a half meter from the limbus, secure that into the uh, sulcus. And then uh, once that is done, the, the I was still not quite center, I thought. So it uh, looks like it's a little bit sunset. So uh, a third uh, tender folding was put in, in superiorly that uh, exactly the same as the other two. And at the end, um, the place, the hour was well secure in the center. to the very end where, so at the end, um, I tied up all the sutures and now the uh, IL is well secure. I don't have to enlarge the wound. I don't have to figure out how to take out the capsule retention ring. And the patients only have three small uh, incisions on the limbus and uh, have a nice recovery. So that's the end of the case. So it's just one option for, uh, for doing the, um, kind of uh, securing a dislocated intraocular lens implant. In this case, happened to have a full capsule with some residual lens material and a capsule retention ring. So using a tenolylon suture to anchor them into the sulcus without having to expand them will be one uh, options of surgery to uh, secure the uh, dislocated IOL. Thank you very much, Dr. Rachin. And it was beautiful surgery, very, very nice. And uh, I will open to Dr. Natarajan to comment on this. And at first, I, I just wanna say it's very, very elegant and you make it simpler than doing more procedures in an eye that has already a good lens inside and you could use it. Thank you. Dr. Natarajan, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, no, I think excellent surgery, lots to learn from watching. And I think it's a really, this is where the ambidextrity of the surgeon is exhibited. And I think he did a great job of managing the complex the entire uh, with the lens uh, dropped in and brought it back. And I think uh, usually because I never like to do anything anterior, so I call my anti-segment surgeon to tackle the intraocular lens. And I, I know many VR surgeons do it and watching land that did a great job. Great uh, watching. Thank you. It, um, I, I like to hear the other people's comment too. Sometimes, um, especially when you have a capsule retention ring, 
uh, it could be a bit of a challenge to remove them because they worry about the uh, that uh, long piece of uh, uh, rigid material can strike the peripheral retina and uh, and remove them uh, takes extra precautions. So in, in this case, I decided um, this may actually may be a safer way without having to deal with two components because one is the single piece IOL and I couldn't suture it in place and normally because it's a single piece and uh, and then I have to also remove the capsule retention ring. So, so those are the two considerations and, uh, and it happened to work well. And in fact, I, I started off thinking the same, just to take out, uh, remove the capsule and take out each one of the uh, kind of uh, bone body in this case now in the vitreous cavity, uh, one at a time. But uh, it works out to be a, a simpler by having them suture. As, uh, and it is the capsule, like even without the uh, capsule retention ring, if you have a full capsule, you can also suture that in place because the capsule uh, allow you to uh, uh, use the tendon line on suture to tendon a polling suture to anchor in place. Yeah, uh, very good, Dr. Lam. I think your surgery was perfect, was beautiful. And I think this is one of the, the unique cases that I, uh, I think we should uh, use the same IOL that is inside when it's dropped. Usually when you have only the IOL without the bag, uh, I try to avoid to use the same IOL that is inside, uh, mainly if it's not the surgery done by me because we don't know what happens with the aptics. Sometimes you think it's okay, but the memory of the aptics may change and you can have, uh, uh, again, uh, a luxated IOL and one one comment interesting that I saw in uh, in one of those webinars, a friend performed uh, the hashtag technique for those cases, and we know that the hashtag techniques maybe for the only for the intraocular lens, I think it's not safe. But he what he was mentioned uh, is that due to the the complex bag and in your case also the ring it's a possibility of performing the, the hashtag technique. Although I think your technique was very, very clean and I think it's safer for those type of patients. Sometimes you don't want to do a third surgery and you think, oh, if I had done a traditional one, a fixation, maybe I had a better result. But it's just this that I want to, to bring up is the possibility of doing the hashtag technique for those cases. I never did for those cases but I'd like to see if anyone has any comment about it. Uh, How's the hashtag technique done? Uh, I'm not sure. So the hashtag technique, uh, as the, the, the name say, it make, you make a hashtag with the, the proline. Oh, okay. Right. So we, you, had to, you, you had to, re, to put the, the complex over the anterior chamber, perform the hashtag, and then you pull over the, the, all this complex. I think it's uh, also called the last one. If I can, if I can comment on that, sorry. Yeah, initially sorry. the the hashtag. If I don't, if I'm not wrong, but initially the the hashtag was performed first to avoid the the, the silicone oil to come in the anterior chamber for for a fake patient. And it was described by Dr. Samuel Maskett, I think in 2011 or 13, and it was described as net technique because you cross Berlin like 90 degrees, a double arm. And then you can put the IOL on it and it won't fall. And it also works when you have silicon oil in the vitreous cavity because it avoids the coming to the anterior chamber. I think we have uh, many nice, interesting ways of doing acrobatics with IOLs these days. Uh, but I think what uh, Wai Ching did for this eye was probably the best surgery for this eye. And I think we're going to probably see more cases with capsular retention rings as patients all over the world gets older. There's more uh, incidence of pseudo exfoliation dislocations where uh, you know, anterior segment surgeons tend to use more CTRs. And uh, whenever during a surgery, uh, if you don't know that there's a CTR beforehand and you encounter it, you're like, oh man, this is kind of suck now. And because uh, we always struggle taking it out and, you know, uh, trying to cut it, etc. It's really tough. So I think this was very elegant. And I think uh, it's great that you knew beforehand that the eye had the CTR. And so when possible, I think it's great to have the op report from the previous surgery, if, uh, if possible, just so you know what hardware you're dealing with. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Uh, André Juca is asking, how did you keep, did you keep the lens on the iris plane for suturing, Dr. Wage? Um, I used the uh, retractor to hold it in place. And, uh, and then um, I actually have my assistant keep that in position so that I can uh, pass the polling needle through the um, uh, capturing the haptic and the uh, capture retention ring and using the 25 gauge needle to guide it through. So uh, um, I was just holding it with the Richard's cutter. Yeah, congratulations. It's not, not a simple thing to do. It, with a simple material, of course. Uh, Dr. Sethi is asking if you, if the haptic, the haptic is broken, would you prefer this technique? Well, first of all, if the haptic's broken, it may not be possible to do this properly. But uh, if the bag, the capsule bag, is still intact, then uh, then it is still possible because. Um, you are anchoring the uh, haptic and the back together. So it is the capsule back that actually holds things together. So I, I'm not sure um, what, the, what the question means. If, the, if it's a three-piece uh, IOL with the haptic broken, then no, it, it won't be possible. And um, um, this case particularly is possible to be sutured in places because the capsule back is intact and it's a single piece IOL. So, uh, um, so it is possible to suture it. But uh, if you have a broken haptic in the three piece IOL, then I don't think it will be, I don't think it will be possible. Okay, uh, Andrei Juca is asking if you, you use the probe vacuum to hold it or you just support it with the, the retractor? Yeah, it just supported with retractor. It was, uh, you didn't see it. Uh, the IOL was actually swimming in, in the vitreous cavity. But once um, uh, it, it was elevated and you can just trap it with the cutter against the iris plane, um, it is not uh, that challenging to do so. Um, because with the capsule, the, the, um, uh, the whole piece, the whole complex is actually a little bulky. And uh, so you just need to gently lift it against the iris plane, and that's it. Okay, Dr. Francini from Brazil, friend of ours, has a question for you. Yeah, Dr. Len, congratulations sure. for your surgery. Very beautiful, very elegant. And I would like to say, uh, Vasco just said, but uh, what I was agree, um, uh, find out is that a hashtag technique is very nice for this case that you show and it's very safe too because you can put all the bagular sac uh, at, at over the iris and then you push put the proline down it and it, it's very stable i have I, i've already done it i've already done it as you you showed here it's very nice too but sometimes when people don't have the security to do it and to put the proline at the side that the correct uh, properly um, space, maybe uh, sometimes it can be very, um, how can I say, it can touch the iris or it can touch the ciliar body and have some blotting, but it's a very elegant technique. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting case. Uh, now I'm going to call Dr. Marcelo Murillo Sasamoto, our friend from Bolivia. Do you want to share your screen, Marcelo? Yes. Let me see. Thank you. Okay, just let you know that we are working with an academic platform called uh, Ophthalmology League in Latin America with some other colleagues from Argentina and Uruguay. Well, no brilliance. Can you see it? Yeah, that is perfect. Okay. So 
the name of the technique called uh, Tetris technique, Tetris retinectomy technique. I usually perform before uh, this combined large radial retinectomy with a circumferential retinectomy on the management of uh, advanced proliferative retinopathy. This article was uh, quite interesting and since 2014, I started performing my surgeries, my uh, PBR surgery with uh, this technique. But nowadays, um, I call it this Tetris technique because we use uh, almost the form of the Tetris play video game. And uh, we start with this case. Uh, we have this pediatric retinal detachment, 10 year old boy with all retinal detachment, inferior giant dialysis and inferior PBR. Okay, so we start with uh, the pyritomy. See what's going on in the retina. As you can see the PBR. We're starting to uh, working with the traction using transinolone also to better visualization. And the thing is, uh, uh, the, the form of the retinectomy, we are performing like uh, the Tetris, no? almost like flex. Like a frayed um, form. And this helps us for uh, uh, sometimes to attach the retina avoid uh, complications in the future for reattachment. And it works well for me. Things uh, 2018, I was, I am um, performing this type of uh, procedure when it came to retinectomy. And well, we finished this procedure with silicon oil. So I will so, uh, show you the pre-op and post-op pictures. Those are the post-op, no, one month. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mm -hmm. Sasamoto. Uh, now, I would like to have a comment on this. Dr. Saad Wahib, do you want to comment this? Sure. I mean, um, uh, great surgery. Congratulations, uh, uh, Marcelio. Um, I, th I think, uh, you know, doing um, uh, ret retinectomies in these cases is sometimes essential to try to flatten uh, the retina. But, but my question is, how long do you keep uh, uh, silicone? And have you had uh, uh, problems with hypotony in these cases postoperatively? Yes, uh, um, I I wanted to I want to comment also that uh, we use a metrotexate every fifteen days, you no, know, to avoid uh, uh, retinal detachment. So, um, hypotony, yes, is usually common. Also, new vascularization, but uh, this specific case, I had like a twelve or uh, ten. Uh, 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 millimeters of mercury of uh, uh, pressure. But uh, yes, it's commonly the hypotony and sometimes you use corticosteroids or uh, to maintain in the aqueous humor uh, in that with good levels. Yes, uh, usually corticosteroids uh, would be my answer. Okay. Okay. If I can comment, uh, I think that was great surgery, that uh, relaxing radial incision also disrupts the circumferential traction in addition to the radial traction that's relieved by regular retinectomies. And so I think the release of the tractional vectors in all directions, it's, it's really cool. Um, in this case, I think personally, um, in my hands, that would have been the second surgery that I do. And there was a lot of PVR, but I think a lot of uh, children, especially with uh, dialysis, they do really well with a primary buckle, even if there's PVR. Um, and uh, even if a buckle fails, I feel like you don't lose too much in terms of the PVR progressing too much. Um, 
And so I think that's another consideration too. But I think you're, you know, you went all out, released all attraction, and that was really good surgery. Thank you. I also agree that it's a great, uh, quick surgery I've shown. And uh, uh, one thing that I like to share is that when I try to decide if I need to do a, a radio relaxing incisions, is I, I go to air. And I, under air, you can see quite a bit of the residual traction that you may not have been able to see. Because if you put the uh, perforcum fluid, everything looks flat. But once you start taking out that heavy fluid, the, um, the persistent traction that you may not have been taken care of will show. And, uh, and I found that under air, if you still have a, a persistent traction, a radio incision uh, uh, like you did helps to release that. And you can see that under air, it will flatten. And that is quite reassuring. And you also know that you don't have to do excessive uh, uh, retinectomy if you don't have to. And uh, so I too, uh, I agree with uh, Yusei Hero that um, uh, the buckle uh, could uh, be useful. Although in the case of a giant tear, um, I especially depending on if it's 180, then uh, I don't use a buckle. If it's only three o'clock hour, then a buckle may be uh, useful. And, and I tend to use a broader buckle because um, a narrow buckle can create fish mouth. and. Uh, um, a wider surface will avoid that. And uh, so a selections of the, uh, the proper size of the buckle will help to reduce the, uh, the complications also. But well, well done. Thank you. Excellent comment, doctor. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Andrei Juca, do you want to comment on this case? Sure, congratulations. Excellent case, my friend. Uh, do you use uh, metotrexate as a routine in these uh, severe uh, PVR cases, or is uh, how do you use who is going to go under metotrexate, and for how long time do you do it? Each fifteen days for how much time? Three months. Yes. Yeah. We will start every fifteen days. Um, uh, we start with uh, 1,200 uh, 1, uh, uh, micro, and then we change to uh, 400 every, uh, every month. So the first three months is every 15 days, and then we change every month for uh, a six-month period. So that's uh, assuring sometimes that uh, there's no uh, a reattachment. So that's the principal problem in, in this retinal pediatric uh, inflammation. And uh, uh, it, it's going well. I mean, since um, 2018, uh, we are performing also using the metrotexate uh, with good results. Not in all patients, but this uh, uh, complicated uh, pediatric patient, yes, we're using in that, uh, that form. Oh, are you using for six months? Six Even months. after silicone oil removal? Then we perform the silicone oil, yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. How do you give the methyl trapsis? Systemically or local? No, 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 intravitreal. Intravitreal. What's yeah. your dosage that you use for methyl trapsis intravitreal? 1,200 first at the beginning, and then uh, 400 of maintenance. Do you, do you adjust the dose for silicone oil use because uh, you already have silicone oil in the eye? No, no, no. I mean, uh, uh, even though if the patient uh, was without silicone oil, I would use the same dose. Oh, okay. Because with the oil in the eye, the, uh, the volume of distributions will be reduced. So toxicity is not a concern? Yes. So the, the same problem happens with the use of antiangiogenics and silicon oil. You know, I mean, the effect. So uh, I used to uh, perform, maintain the dose. And um, actually, I don't know uh, what's the difference uh, uh, with the silicon oil. I agree that the, uh, the dosing will be very uh, different because of the, just the very thin aqueous layer between the oil uh, and the retina. 
And however, the idea of maintaining the same concentration uh, was from uh, the methotrexate treatments for lymphoma cases and where people just did the same 400 milligrams, uh, which worked really great. And that's what we're doing also for the uh, Aldera Therapeutics uh, clinical trial, uh, just maintaining the uh, similar dose. But um, I have to say, uh, kids in Bolivia are very brave. I don't know how many kids in the United States who are 10 years old can tolerate these regular intravitreal injections. Uh, kudos to your patients. True. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for the case, Dr. Sasamoto, and thank you for the comments. Uh, now, Andre Juca, do you want to share your screen or do you want us to play your video? I have your video ready here, but if you want, you, if you want to share, you, it's up to you. Uh, you're muted, Andre. Okay, go ahead, my friend. You can okay, share. So I will share it. So I brought uh, two cases, uh, one of uh, complicated, uh, Two cases, two cases uh, that we, we got complication with buckle surgery. One uh, was uh, 10 years later, and the other one was just uh, during the surgery. So we bought this because we, we do a lot of buckle still, and uh, we don't see a lot of uh, in meetings. And then this, this uh, woman had a retinal detachment 10 years before, and he, she was complaining of a lot of pain. We didn't uh, see anything, but anyway, so we decided to remove because she could not uh, take uh, his life normally because of the pain. The retina was okay. Uh, this was 10 years later. We didn't see any sign of infection or something like that. But uh, when we decided to remove uh, the buckle, uh, we realized that uh, we have this opening in the sclera, it was a big hole on the sclera, and we just uh, cut it out, and then uh, yeah, we just uh, decided to suture it because we, we, had, we did not have a scleral patch or something like that. It was just uh, an unpredictable situation, and we just suture it, and we put uh, uh, gas on the eye to keep it uh, formed because uh, even with suture, the eye was very soft. So in the end, we just uh, inserted gas and it was quite uh, amazing to have this uh, situation uh, because the eye was like 20, 25, very good vision. And then uh, we have this in post up and then uh, we, we just think well, what was going on and then we realized please go back a little bit uh, Hudson just sure. one slide please go back yeah and then we realized that there was a hole and uh, okay stop there you see here uh, there is a hole uh, in the center of this uh, darker part that we we just missed it uh, and this uh, there was a scleral necrosis and that's why the patient had so much pain. This was 10 years after. So uh, the retina was fine, but uh, she couldn't bear the pain. And we decided to remove it. And when we removed it, there was this big hole on the sclera. So it was kind of a, a surprise. And when we uh, went to study the, ca the case, what did we miss? And there was this sign here. Um, in the center that now we are very uh, paying attention to this kind of sign uh, in this situation. So this is the, the trick, okay? Uh, okay, uh, if anyone want to comment on or share if they have uh, cases like that. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Very good case, Dr. Yuka. Uh, Dr. Yoshihiro, do you wanna comment on this one? Oh, um, I was just uh, commenting on the chat, chat function here that it's very unusual. Uh, you know, you can see this with mirror gel buckles uh, where sometimes you can have internal erosion, but it seems like you just had a regular silicone band uh, that was not mirror gel, right? Right, yeah. Was very not, unusual. It was just a standard uh, buckle with uh, a band, 240 band, and I think it was 
seven, six, seven buck or something like that. Yeah, but but uh, it was, it was what, unusual. I know it's very unusual because I also do a lot of buckle and sometimes we keep removing. But how long was the pain before? Uh, I, I tried to manage it uh, for months, like three months. Then uh, I, she was very tired and I was very tired and I decided to remove it. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, I think so. Uh, sometimes I think better to remove earlier so that this necrosis may not have, but very difficult to yeah. say. I think yeah. this one couldn't tell till the last that there is a necrosis and I have a hole in the sclera. But I think this is what I keep telling the patient. Removing buckle is not simple. You have to, there's the risk of many things and we yeah. have to take our, uh, and then do the surgery. Good. Yeah, yeah, you know, but there, uh, everything was so fine and, you know, uh, the retina is so good, the vision is so good. It's not going to touch it. Just try something to uh, keep the pain Okay, and I was not sure that was it, uh, but in, in the end was that. I, I didn't understand why there was so much pain. And the reason was that it was this uh, scleral uh, rupture, this is scleral necrosis. Yeah, yes. uh, just yeah. want to make a comment that um, there's a lot of cryo in, in the area of the tear. And if you do cryo, um, I wouldn't say excessive, but you do a lot of cryo, you do uh, cause some uh, damage to the scura. And if there are already pre-existing uh, thinning in that area, so you can potentially um, set up for uh, uh, necrosis uh, later on. And in the area where the buckle is pressing against it, you have a double whammy. So you damaged the, uh, the tissue with the cryo and you have pressure applied uh, with the uh, a very, Kind of firm and high buckle, and then uh, that that combination may be part of the reason uh, that could happen. Yeah, I think uh, you are right. I I think this was the the mechanism that uh, did happen, and uh, the sign uh, that I missed was this uh, dark area in the center. This uh, area in this area you have no sclera, just tenon and conjunctiva blocking everything. So the eye was not hypotonus, you know. The eye was uh, in, in normal pressure situation. So, uh, uh, but this uh, dark area in the center should be a sign to pay attention that this may have uh, ruptured the globe. So you may prepare better than I did using a scleral patch to cover it instead of suturing. Although the suturing, uh, it, it just worked. Yeah, you did very well. A lot of people will have panicked. I will have been panicked. Looking oh, at that. Uh, <laughs> you done very good surgery then. Beautifully repaired. Thank uh, you. Next, okay. Did did the pain resolve? Yeah, the pain resolved. Yeah, so so that's that's great. Yeah, in the end. Although. But this uh, this next case was uh, inferior detachment. Uh, there was this small uh, hole here in this latsy. And uh, it was a young myop and uh, uh, we decided to go to buckle surgery because she was like 20 or something. And uh, we did uh, put the buckle, we, we do in this case buckle with uh, endo laser after uh, external drainage and uh, we do not use uh, cryo anymore. Not, of, not because of the last case, but we are moving to uh, to do laser, but when we're doing the laser, we, we saw something was going out and the patient was just under, uh, please uh, come back a little bit, uh, Hudson. Uh, the patient was under, stop there. No, a little bit more. Okay, a little bit more. I, I just want to show the flap. The, the patient had LASIK and come back more. No, just to the external surgery. Hudson, come back, yeah. Yeah, I stopped there. This is the the flap that uh, moved out. So uh, we're not sure, and we asked the patient, did you get a LASIK surgery? And the patient said, yeah, yeah, I did get LASIK. And uh, that's it. Uh, there was the flap that dislocated during the surgery. So you do not, the trick here is you do not bother trying to put it back because we're not going to get it until the end of the surgery. You just move it away put uh, uh, the, some gel uh, over the stroma of the cornea and just go ahead. 
And at the end of the surgery, you put the flap back and put some contact lens and you, it, it will work just fine. So we did move the flap out of the way, put some uh, gel and just, uh, you see, you just did the surgery because the flap just dislocated. Okay. Okay. You can go ahead to the, play the video, please. Okay. So you just move it, you just put some gel, you just do the laser and the laser with the illuminated probe. And then uh, I, I just like to suture it anyway. Uh, and then you suture the cone and then uh, you just put back uh, uh, the flap is Okay, that's it. Uh, that's just uh, another unusual situation, but we are seeing more and more of this patient that have gone under LASIK and uh, just put the contact lens to, to protect it. That's, uh, and this is the pose up. So uh, the trick was just to do not uh, bother with the flap, just uh, put it away and uh, it will work just fine. Uh, anyone has had uh, this uh, kind of complication during? No, I, uh, the only thing is I, I have done it, but uh, luckily I didn't face the complication. But in case you knew the patient had LASIK done, would they have done anything different? Well, I'm not sure. Maybe I would be more careful uh, wet in the cornea. Okay. Perhaps uh, using uh, gel before to avoid it. Uh, you know, uh, you, when you do the maneuvers, uh, moving around, and uh, it's really, and this patient had LASIK like uh, three or four years before, it was not recent. No, sure, I think uh, you managed it very well. And I have done with the post classic buckle, but I think every time I tell, use the, the skip and retractor and say that the cornea has covered well and then turn the eyes carefully. And I keep mm -hmm. telling the thing, don't make a tug of war with the pulling the muscles. So I, I agree, I think. And then you have to have a speculum which does not have any sharp edge so that when you turn, that doesn't hit. Yeah, yeah, good. Thank you. Dr. Rodrigo Pegado, do you have a comment on this one? Yeah, I think he didn't hear. Rodrigo Pegado, can you hear us? I think he's... I'm asking him to unmute. Uh, I had a question. I think, the he, first I think he lost yeah. connection. Rodrigo, can you hear? Yeah, it's better now. Okay. Can you, you have a uh, comment on this case from uh, Dr. Andrea Juca? Andrea, you use the 27 gauge in your surgeries now. Yeah, I do use, but in this case, I use the 25 gauge. I like the 25 gauge because it has a illumination on it. So uh, I do not have a 27 gauge probe that's, that has an illumination on it. So uh, I like to use just one and then do the job. So it was a 25 gauge probe, but uh, there is just one uh, sclerotomy. Okay, Dr. Sethi, do you want to comment on this one? I just have a, a, a question for the first case, uh, Dr. Andre, very nice, uh, un unusual cases that you're showing. Uh, in the first case, would it, you think it would be possible to have harvested a partial thickness level flap in the same eye and then close that uh, defect, like we make a self uh, a tunnel, and then you know, just leave that, take that partial flap in case we can't suture it? Yeah, uh, I would do a scleral patch, but I was not prepared. It was a, a kind of a surprise. So I have to do to do what I got on that uh, instant. So uh, we, we do have a, a lot of scleral patch, but in that situation, I was uh, not looking for it. And, you know, it's just uh, something that happened. What uh, the trick there was just to really find out what's going on with the patient. 
because pain is a very subjective uh, feeling. And we, at first, we do not really uh, believe the patient because the eye was, the eye was quiet, there was no inflammation, no secretion. It was many years ago, 10 years ago. So we, we just uh, do not believe really the patient, the vision was good. And there was this pain that the patient keep com coming back. But there was a sign that I missed, was that uh, dark uh, spot on, in the center of the whitish area. And I do believe that the grill was a little heavy and this uh, may have caused this late uh, scleral necrosis. And, and the pressure of the eye it was normal. The eye was not impotent. That would be a, a evident sign or, of the rupture of the glow. So it was it, difficult to, to see, but there was a sign. Uh, now I can, uh, I learned, and uh, I would like to share that. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Juca. Uh, so, Dr. Rodrigo Pegado, we shall move forward to our case. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the organizer, Dr. Hudson Nakamura, and uh, moderate uh, Rafael Arantes. I'm from the small city, uh, and the small city near to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, uh, in this case, we did a Paris plan, it packed me in the eyes uh, with a PP. Uh, v, can you play, please? Okay, good song. Can you play? Okay. I work uh, together with my partner Luis Gustavo in Niterói. You don't have the sound. Uh, Wilson, it's better I share. May I share? Yeah, you can share. Yeah, thank you. The sound is better with the music and then. You did this case in uh, Rio? We, we cannot hear the, the volume because you, you're using a earphone, okay? Uh, we cannot hear the case, okay? Because uh, yeah. Okay, okay, the, okay, okay. The no problem, no. Okay, okay, no problem. Just a minute. The patient had a retinal tra uh, tractum redetachment. He also had proliferative vitreal retinopathy. Previously combined cataract and PPV for TRD, silicone oil uh, for month ago. The pupil was dilated. After removing the oil of extractment, we performed membrane ectomy. We so did first macular peeling. And then uh, retina got all tractions. Did you use the cautery? Yeah. But 
let's go to the video and after removing the traction with uh, the rent piece and cutting them we on the laser performing They are doing PR, PRP now. Yeah. There was no need for silicone oil. We inserted the intraocular gas. The retina remained attached. And then operates the fluid the glaucoma. For my kids. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Rodrigo. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Hudson, you, do you want to comment on this case? Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, good. Uh, Rodrigo, great case. And uh, uh, you did not use silicone oil, and uh, I saw these some uh, pre retinal hemorrhages, but I think they were just. Uh, uh, not uh, you, you didn't have, have any bleeding, so that was okay without silicone oil, okay? And uh, you did the good retinotomies and uh, performed the uh, cautery. So the, the, the different thing I would do, I would do a little more uh, endocautery because during these uh, uh, hemorrhages, during the case, the media gets very hazy. So I like doing endocautery for most of the cases and then I'm, I'm really confident that I won't have any problem uh, leaving the, the air with uh, gas. Otherwise, I would use silicone oil. But the case was, was great. Really very good performance. Yeah, you use the, the gas. Uh, we prefer the patients in the future to operate the glaucoma, maybe. And then uh, we remember 25% uh, of Diabetics related visual loss stems from complications. And then we need to operate faster the patients, the kids. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Hudson, do you want to share your video? Yeah, I was uh, the, the, the last trauma case that we saw. I have a case very interesting on trauma that I did not use the magnet. I, 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 this was really, really challenging. I will share it in just a moment. We had this uh, intraocular gunshot injury, intraocular foreign body. You have the uh, lesion there, a vertical one, and uh, the two foreign bodies inside the eye, one in the mid vitreous and uh, another one stuck at the retinal periphery, stuck on the choroid. And I uh, did the ultrasound, and uh, you see, you can actually see hyper reflectivity with uh, the two intraocular foreign bodies. The orexis were so tough, everything was adherent, and uh, we had these vitreous, the anterior chamber, we had to, to go ahead with the vitrectomy. And, uh, that's where the uh, intraocular body was sitting, one of them. You see the intraocular body. The media was a little hazy, but uh, we could uh, still grab the intraocular body without any problem, without using PFC, and uh, removing it uh, without a magnet. That this one was, was a small one. So, but the second one, take a look. I just, uh, I saw the intraocular body. I just, I just uh, picked on the, the foreign body itself. I did not, uh, was hard on the choroid, uh, not even the retina, and then I removed it. it. But uh, then when I went back to the retina, the retina in the, at the periphery was the detached the, because of the intraocular body. Then we used uh, PFO to attach the retina, do the appropriate uh, endolaser. As you see here, the endolaser and the retina got fully attached with no slippage. And after that, uh, that laser, I did a direct exchange as we were commenting with uh, Dr. Devenier. 
uh, this exchange direct, uh, we don't have any slippage. I did the endo laser in the far periphery under silicon oil. And uh, this is the post-operative period. And uh, the patient is, is, uh, is cool. The case is great and the retina is attached so far. And uh, we are trying to plan for the uh, silicone oil removal, not now. The surgery was uh, two months ago. And uh, I presented this surgery into iTube and the iTube people asked me to invite you to share your videos there. It's uh, pretty easy. You just uh, have to share a video and comment and uh, narrow down the video to maybe three minutes and something. And uh, uh, they're gonna accept your video if it's good. And they asked me to, to share the, this information with you as well. Okay, thank you very much, So, Dr. Wei Ching Lam, do you want to comment on this video? In this case, sorry. Yes, uh, I'd like to congratulate Hudson for doing such a beautiful uh, surgery these days. And uh, um, managing foreign body is not always easy. And uh, especially as he has shown that uh, surprises can come up. The, uh, once you take out the foreign body, you may have a retinal detachment to uh, fix. And you may even have a double perforations because of the, uh, the uh, depth of the penetrations of the foreign body. Um, I think um, it is always an advantage to be able to do both the anterior segment and posterior segment surgery. And he showed the, uh, the approach that he did faithful first and, uh, uh, and then uh, deal with the, uh, uh, the posterior segment uh, injury. Um, in the North Rexes, America... The Rexes, was, the, the yeah. Rexes were, was very tough. And uh, yeah. we know in yeah. advance that the capsule was ruptured so we didn't have, didn't have any choice uh, uh, as to remove the uh, uh, lens by uh, lensectomy, but the lens was not so hard. You know, the lens was uh, quite, uh, kind of fluffy. And then we went ahead with the uh, vitrectomy to prepare for future the uh, implant, secondary implant, because the macula is okay. And I think this guy has a good outcome. Yeah, no, it's great. It's very well done and uh, um, congratulations. This was uh, really tough. This was really challenging. <laughs> my last yeah. case, my last case, <laughs> Yoshihiro, was a uh, macular hole. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this decision, the tough decision, the challenging decision from the last case, last uh, retinoson two, was to decide what to do. But this one, I had no choice. I had to go ahead and uh, remove the uh, intraocular foreign bodies. And one thing interesting, I was searching for another third intraocular foreign body, but there were only two. But then I was searching, and then I found the infusion line. I found the, the you know the, the metal thing from the uh, infusion line, and uh, uh, I thought it would be. Uh, but we have to search, you know, all the time. Otherwise, if we leave, as uh, you were commenting in the previous cases, if we leave the uh, intraocular foreign body there, and we get cytoroses and other complications, the case is lost. Yeah, your pre-op assessment helps uh, your. Like you did a CT and you also do uh, an ultrasound and that should uh, help you to determine the locations and the number of foreign body that you need to uh, take care of. So, so you're absolutely right. I think time spent both preoperatively and in, uh, particularly to uh, making sure uh, you account for all the foreign body that you have to be uh, dealing with intraoperatively. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Dr. Sethi, do you want to comment on this? I think a very well managed case. And uh, I just want to ask uh, the Dr. Hudson, did you do an ILM peeling as well in this case? And what is your take on the ILM peeling in trauma cases? No, I, I did not do ILM peeling for this case because the uh, macula was, was cool, was normal, but uh, there were. Uh, you know, the vitreous, the uh, hyaloid, the posterior hyaloid at the beginning of the case was so adherent, was so difficult to remove it. I had to cut with the cutter flush to the retina without reaching the retina, but it was tough. I had to, you know, the vitrectomy took about uh, 20, 25 minutes to remove all the vitreous because it was very adherent. 
but I didn't do any PO because I, I, the method was clear and I did not see any reason for doing that. Uh, uh, great case. Can I, can I have a, a quick question? Is it possible? Yeah, yeah, of course. Sure. Uh, great case, Hudson. Um, I was just um, wondering, how, what do you feel about uh, using PFC in these cases? Yeah, and the idea of protecting the macula when you're dealing with, uh, with these foreign bodies. And the other thing is that what I've noticed personally is when you have these uh, foreign bodies impacted, I like to leave the removal of the foreign body to the end. So I want to make sure I remove all the vitreous because I'm worried if I go behind uh, after the foreign body first, you get double perforation and you get fluids going into the orbit and then it becomes a mess. So I don't know how the panel or how do you feel about this? I feel that the, this surgery, you know, after we remove the vitreous, the one of the intraocular foreign bodies that we diagnosed and uh, uh, via ultrasound and CT, it was just floating on the vitreous and uh, was sitting on the retina. So I thought it was so so easy to use the macular lens to have a, a, a good view very close to the intraocular foreign body, and I used this crocodile forceps just like that, and I I, I had very good 3D. So. I, I didn't feel like uh, having to use PFC to protect anything because it was easy to, to catch it, as you saw in the video, and just uh, remove it. And I, I, I took it in the forceps and uh, just uh, uh, took it out of the eye. And uh, it, this was this malleur uh, in Draco Faribar. The other one that was stuck in the very periphery, the reason I didn't use it, I don't think I would have to use the magnet, is that I saw I use a very peripheral wide angle lens. And so I saw it and I, I went straight to the foreign body with the same forceps, the uh, crocodile, and then I grab it and I just remove it. So I did not cause any trauma. The, the trauma that I think I caused at the end of the case was trying to search for another intraocular foreign body going after uh, the very periphery because I had to do that. Otherwise, if I left any uh, foreign body, maybe the case will be finished, you know, within time and sad roses. And then I was trying to find it and I found the, uh, uh, the, the, the infusion line, but no problem. Then the periphery, I just uh, did the uh, PFC, did the barrier laser that worked very well and uh, direct uh, for the exchange and then with the laser around the hole. And uh, no, the question to, uh, the, the answer to Dr. Saad Vahib is that uh, double perforation, I think, so fortunately, the patient takes few weeks, few days to come. And by the time there is some healing happens, so I think the fluid doesn't go through the perforation because I have removed pellets or pellets have gone through uh, the uh, uh, vitreous retina and choroid and into the orbit. But nothing happens. Only thing I toilet the wound and I don't enter there, but I think I do, I treat it like a coloboma right on in the place where the exit wound is there and uh, and in Hudson's case also a beautiful case where you remove I think usually fluid doesn't go through that and uh, uh, I think I, I think only when the foreign body is in the vitreous I usually remove it before completing the vitrectomy so that I don't want the foreign body to fall down on retina but if it is impacted like the Hudson's case I don't I remove it and I don't think anything only thing I do uh, end is that around it and then remove it so that if there's some hemorrhage happens, you should already have done a laser and the hemorrhage will clear. Yeah, yeah. And the patient's happy, you know, we're just waiting for his own corticoids, but the eye is calm, no inflammation now. And uh, we're just waiting for about uh, three or four months uh, to remove the uh, uh, silicone oil, or maybe not, or maybe implant the lens, uh, the lens, uh, the trochlear lens uh, without removing the silicone oil. But, if it gets good enough, and uh, I would probably uh, remove and uh, implant the IOL right away. Yeah, yes. Wonderful, Hudson. Really great kiss. Thank you, okay. thank you, Dr. Dagan. Okay, so now we are closing the event now, and I would like to thank you all the participants to the high level of the cases presented. We expect to you all at the next event of written awesome and if you have any consideration mic is open for you yeah no i just wanted to invite everybody as a part of our ocular trauma society of india we are celebrating silver jubilee 
uh, and we are doing a first video festival on uh, ocular trauma we have hudson as our uh, key keynote speaker tomorrow it's at 7 pm india time it is a otsi it will be there in the youtube and and i'm sure hudson will put it in the group and I hope over as time because i know today you had a long session i'm me and hudson will be there again for a long session tomorrow but tomorrow is exclusive trauma and uh, thank you very much hudson and i am part of your right now awesome and thanks for you to be part of our ocular trauma society of india yeah thank you for inviting me and uh, uh dr castellanos i was uh, also apologize for not not being here she had this problem this issue with the uh, video but uh, we know about uh, dr luca michel's father and you know he passed away two days ago but uh, i'm very happy to be with you and uh, thank you dr diveni my professor dr lem uh, wahid <laughs> Ad, my, my partner and uh, uh, yoshihiro and uh, everybody vasco bravo drejuka and uh, the important thing is i have to say here that the important person here is uh, half hour antes you know i got disconnected here for a while due to internet issues but uh, you know it, the difference is made when we have a good moderator and uh, i have to thank you dr uh, half hour antes for being such a good doctor and uh, such a good moderator and that uh, this session was uh, pretty 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 good Thank, Thank you very you. much. It's my pleasure. No need for anything. Yes. So, I think we are closing here. Bye bye everyone. See you bye. next event. Thank See you, you later. Bye. Have a great day. Great. Bye bye. Bye bye. What have Bye. Tá na van. Rodrigo, nice cake. Congratulations. Thank you, Hudson. And we will see you tomorrow. And yeah. tomorrow we are going to have the Zoom open an hour yeah. before, whenever you want. Did you get, did you get to know? Why uh, have? Why have? Na tra van. Do you do live close? Do you work close? With the same thing? Uh, no, yeah, yeah. No, he's in Delhi. Vibo is Vibo City is in Delhi. And uh, ah, I know, yeah. and I know his uh, father, his mother, and also the grandfather. Yeah, that's and, great. And also the whole family, rather. Uh -huh, I know. I was there uh, since last spent the last year. Spent a day. Family yeah. with uh, lots of quality and uh, plays great music as well. You know. <laughs> yes. Yes. Very good case, uh, Doctor. I have. I, I did not share your case because my internet. I don't know why. This is a very good internet connection here, but. Uh, You know the moderator was great doing his job. Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good, Rabo. Nice to see you. Nice to Thank see you. you. Have a good night. Good night. Good. Yes. And have a good, good nice day. See morning. you tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, bye bye. See you tomorrow.